and somebody turn off the smog machine. Now, much better, much better. It may be called the City of Angels, but there's no dodging the fact this is not a one-horse town, but it is a one-skipper studio. And coincidentally, we have met our quota. Hi, everyone. Welcome inside the Fox Network Center. You thought I was really choking. Uh, you're okay, Did not you? come to my you're aid, good. by you're the way. Good. Kevin Kennedy, I'm Jeannie Zalasko. <laughs> this is the Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week interleague play. Love it or hate it. Uh, one manager that doesn't mind is Mike Sosha because he gets to play National League here again. Well, Mike was in AAA managing a couple of years ago. He was let go by the Dodgers, signed by the Angels. He brought three Dodgers with him. Coaches Mickey Hatcher, the hitting coach, first base coach Alfredo Griffin, and Ron Reinecke, a third base coach. So there's a lot of Dodger influence in this matchup today. Mike Sosha, since he's become an Anaheim Angel in in-league play with the Dodgers, he is now 5-2. and two. Yes, while we're going down <laughs> memory lane, another Dodger, Pedro Martinez on the mound at Fenway, had to rub that in. The Phillies in town. Oh, Pedro had everything going, the high fastball, the good changeup again, Jeannie. Seeking changeup right there. Power fastball in the inside corner. Um, unbelievable overhand curveball. I mean, just putting people away early. Everything going until top of the six with a 3-1 count and nobody out. A mistake by Peter Martinez. Trying to go down the way. He missed the middle in inside the pesky pole right there. A home run from number nine hitter, Marlon Anderson. Yeah, getting it done. Peter Martinez gives up four earned runs for the first time in his 13th start this season. Only the fifth time in his last three seasons. We're off at Yankee Stadium. The Braves in town, but more importantly, Bernie Williams going out. It's gotten very hot. Bernie Williams hitting over 280 now since he's been back in the lineup. Healthy, doing a good job. And then Take a look, Brian Jordan, Yankees, Braves, seesaw and back and forth. Jordan late in the ball game off of Almanzar to put the Braves ahead. And this one has been a battle. Bernie Williams, the two-run home run, is ninth on the season. That keeps that hitting streak alive at 12. Bottom seven, and the war wages on. It's the battle of Chicago as well. All knotted up at three, bottom eight. Rondell White with a solo home run, his 14-game hitting streak alive. Coming up next, bragging rights on the line at Dodger Stadium. Shadow Park has already earned the right to talk. He's going for a seventh win at home. We are going nowhere. We'll bring you highlights. Enjoy the game. You're watching Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week. Look at you. What? Nice. Hundred bucks. Come on. No, a hundred. With pants. It's a suit, man. Yes, pants. Three hundred elsewhere. Fox. Welcome to Sold Out Dodger Stadium for the freeway series between the Anaheim Angels and the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the Dodgers go into play today, lost a game in the standings last night, four behind the front-running Arizona Diamondbacks in the West. And a pleasant good afternoon to you. Alongside Steve Lyons, I'm Tom Brenneman. Welcome, as always, to Baseball on Fox. The Dodgers have played very well despite many, many injuries, and a big reason why the guy who gets the ball today, Channel Park. Well, he's had to step it up because you have Kevin Brown on the DL. You have Darren Dreifert not pitching as well as they hoped. And this is the guy they're getting this year that they hoped to get when he came over here. you got to remember, from Korea, this is a guy who struggled with the language, struggled with the culture, struggled with the way we play the game over here right now with the six different pitches he throws. He's very tough to handle, and as long as he throws the ball over the plate, he's, he can be very, very difficult to hit. As far as the Angels are concerned, Steve, here they are at game over 500, yet they're 17 behind the amazing Seattle Mariners. If you're the Angels, you got to forget about winning the division. That's not going to happen this year. So go out and play the best baseball you can to try to become the wild card team. You're not going to catch the Mariners. They're playing so well, but don't even worry about what they're doing. And I think that's what happened to them early on. Right now, their offense is starting to pick up a little bit. You have Troy Gloss who's out there having another all-star season. Darren Erstadt starting to put it together, 364 with nine nine multi-hit games over his last 18. He's starting to put it together. The surprise for this team is their pitching, really getting it done with the pitching when they figured they'd have a lot of offense and maybe struggle on the pitching staff. Well, Ramon Ortiz, who figures to be their ace of the future, will be on the mound today, and he'll have to square off with Gary Sheffield, who came off the disabled list last night for the Dodgers. Chan Ho Park gets the ball for L.A. You're watching baseball on Fox. Racing is about making decisions. Well, that was full speed run. Parenting. The Angels have won three in a row in this ballpark, and they've won five of the last seven games overall against the Dodgers. 
Channel Park will get the ball today, a record of 7-4. and four. We'll talk more about him in a moment as the Dodgers take the field. Let's take a look at Mike Sosha's starting lineup for the Anaheim Angels, brought to you by Fran. David Eckstein, the rookie, will lead off and play short. Darren Erstad is in center field, and Troy Gloss, a former UCLA Bruin, has worn out Dodger pitching in 13 games. Tim Salmon and right, Garrett Anderson, the game's only run with a home run here last night, is in left while he joined her at first. George Fabregas behind the plate, Adam Kennedy at second base, and Ramon Ortiz, a right-hander, is on the mat. We mentioned starting it for the Dodgers. Talented young Korean right-hander Chan Ho Park. Uh, you see the highlighted ERA at 286. Anything under three these days is outstanding. Seven and four, and we talked about him becoming the ace of this staff, especially with uh, Brown out of the lineup. You look at the, the scouting report for Chan Ho Park. He's finally reached a comfort level in here. He's become Americanized, if you will. But I'll tell you what. Sometimes Chad Kruder has to put six fingers down in order to play all the pitches that he has. He has two different curveballs, good change, a lot of different pitches he can throw at you, but the key for him is throwing those pitches for strikes. It's when he walks, guys, is when he gets in trouble. Let's take a look at the Dodger defense behind Chan Hope Park. We mentioned Gary Sheffield returned off the disabled list last night, moving Marquise Grissom in the center. Grissom, a four-time Gold Glove winner in center field. Sean Green is in right. Adrian Beltre, Alex Cora, Mark Resolonic, and Paul LaDuca, third to first, a battery of Park. And really the guy who's become his regular catcher, as you mentioned, Steve, Chad Kruder, and what a difference it's made for Park. Uh, and the, the one question I asked Chad yesterday when we were here at the ballpark and talked to him about it, I said, what makes you guys so special with each other? And he goes, I speak Korean. Just right, just deadpan it out there, and I know he doesn't. But uh, he has really handled Park well, and they're very comfortable together. You know, the kind of the, the catcher to the stars kind of mentality really only came about in the last 10 years or so. Charlie O'Brien really was one of the first guys to do it with one of the Atlanta Braves when he was with the Braves uh, and on that staff. What a marvelous job Jim Tracy has done this season, going all the way back to spring training and everything that happened with a Gary Sheffield situation. Then they had so many injuries, Sean Green, Dave Hansen, Adrian Beltre during the spring, and then right into the regular season where it's been one guy after another on the DL. You know about Mike Sosha, homecoming for him. Spent his entire playing career with the Dodgers and has surrounded himself with a number of former Dodgers. Hitting coach Mickey Hatcher, his first base coach Alfredo Griffin, and third base coach Ron Renneke, all former Dodger players. This broadcast also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television. So David Eckstein to lead it off and Park delivers a strike. And we're underway in Los Angeles. Eckstein has been a pleasant surprise for this team. A second baseman throughout his minor league career, but now moved to short on the ground to court and a throw in time one away. Running second, number 17, center fielder, Darren Erskine. Jano Park has certainly had his moments against the Anaheim Angels. Six career appearances, a 2 and one record, a 3.89 ERA, but there have been some brushback pitches. You may remember the encounter two years ago with Tim Belcher when he kicked Belcher after Belcher had tagged him out with Park running up the first baseline. I mean, it's been one thing after another as Darren Erstad looks at ball one. But as you mentioned earlier, the last year and a half now, the maturity of Chan Hole Park beginning to shine through and really dwarf some of those other things that he probably would just like to forget all about. And I think you, you got to give a guy a little bit of time not knowing the culture it would be like if you or I went to Korea and tried to play or tried to broadcast It'd be a little tough to do something like that it would take you a while to adjust and get better at what you're doing. Well, I don't know about you but it would take me a long time to go over there and try and broadcast. I'd be back anything. Home. I'd be back home on the next <laughs> flight. You know, he had the whole incident where they do the rookie hazing thing where they gave him women's clothes to wear on a, on a road trip that they were taking, and he refused to do it. That didn't set very well with his teammates, but they also didn't understand that culturally for him, it was a, it was a great insult for them to take his clothes and to give him women's clothes to wear. He didn't really understand the whole process, and now things have smoothed out, and certainly an ace of this staff. Chopped foul by Darren Erstad, two bowls and two strikes. 
Erstad has worn it out during interleague play in the first four years. He has 102 base hits. That's the most in all of baseball. And he's hit 362. He just had a 15 game hitting streak come to an end. Take a look at those numbers during interleague play. That is entertaining indeed for Angel fans. Swing and a miss. Two up, two down. Now Channel Park has two different curveballs. One a little bit more over the top, and this one a little more sidearm, and then it breaks more like a slider down and into the lefties. Watch Erstad take a swing at it. It looks like he's right on it. Then the big break at the end. Erstad goes back to the bench, shaking his head, thinking, I was on that pitch. I'm not sure why I didn't hit it. Park had one of his more gutsier performances of his very young major league career his last time out. That was in the opener of that big four-game series against the Diamondbacks in Phoenix. As Troy Gloss takes up an end ball one. That was a game where Park swinging the bat his first time up. All of a sudden was reaching back and had pain and discomfort in the back area. Had back spasms, but boy, he needed innings and certainly Jim Tracy needed innings from Park. He gave him seven frames allowed only three runs in the Dodger win. Well that was the big difference too. There was two pitchers on this staff. One of them now pitched last night for the Angels. Ismael Valdez and Chan Ho Park. One of the bigger reasons they got Kevin Brown on this staff was to toughen those guys up a little bit. They wanted Brown to, to sit in these guys back pocket try to make them understand the way he goes about his business on the mound and try to get them to have a little bit better attitude about pitching get them uh, to pitch with a little more guts. Three and to gloss and Park better be very careful right here. Lost one of the big sluggers in the major leagues today out of UCLA already 17 home runs he hit 47 home runs to lead the American League last year and there's ball four. Why take the chance. Didn't want any of Gloss at that at bat, especially with Tim Salmon, who has struggled most of the season, starting to turn it around now. I'd rather pitch to Salmon at right this point in the season any day than Gloss. So now Salmon only hitting 215. Hard to believe. Nine home runs and 23 runs batted in. But like you mentioned during the outset, Steve, certainly Salmon, along with Gloss and Erstead, starting to come around a bit. Here in the last couple of weeks. Last ball in, 1 0. There you get a look. April and May, only five home runs and 16 batted in. Almost as many home runs and a little less than half the number of RBIs this month alone. Salmon does struggle I think it's even more glaring because he's not a streaky player he's a very consistent player he's much like Eric Carroll's here on the Dodgers just consistently produces the numbers at the end of the year you look at him say oh my goodness another tremendous year but at no point during the season does he hit five home runs in four days anything like that he just consistently goes so when he goes poorly it looks even worse base hit into left field the first Anaheim hit in the ball game advancing on to second is Gloss so a two out threat for Anaheim and Garrett Anderson coming up. Number 16. Left fielder. Now this is what Tim Salmon has been working on getting the hands through the zone a little bit more he had been getting jammed that's a pitch that's inside but look how quickly Salmon pulls his hands through the hitting zone great balance and then just whip that ball into the six hole over in the left field. Those were balls in the past during this season that he was getting jammed on. They, they thought he might be standing a little bit too close to the plate. And he said, none of that thing, none of those comments that people were making about what I was doing was really true. I just wasn't getting the job done. I was overreacting and I didn't get enough at bats during spring training. And I, I was really pressing and get, and jamming myself was what was happening. Now Garrett Anderson, a 275 batter, eight home runs, 34 batted in. He got his eighth home run. His first at Dodger Stadium last night, and it proved to be the only run of the game. Garrett Anderson's going to be one of those guys that his power numbers will continue to improve as he gets more experience in the big leagues. He's a big guy. He just gets stronger and stronger with, with each season that passes, but he's really a gap power kind of guy, but you see that. The home run last night hitting it in the left center field. You know, Dodger Stadium is not a great, great hitter's park. You got to hit a long way to get it out of here at the opposite field. 
We've seen the ball through the years carry better during the day, much better during the day than at night when it's a lot warmer. 2-0 is in the air. Right side of the infield, and Breslonic shades his eyes from the sun, and that'll do it. One hit, two men left. Anaheim nothing. The Dodgers and Gary Sheffield are coming up. Anaheim with a scoreless top half of the first, so we move to the bottom half of the inning, and here's the Fram Los Angeles Dodgers starting lineup. Paul Loduca will lead off and play first. Mark Rezolonic, red hot at the plate right now, brings in a 10-game hit streak, will bat second. Gary Sheffield back off the DL and left. Sean Green in right, Marquise Grissom in center, with Adrian Beltre at third. Chad Kruder behind the plate, Alex Cora at short, and Park is on the mound. They'll be facing the 25-year-old right-hander, Ramon Ortiz, and we asked Mike Sosha, is there any tip-off early in the game as to whether Ortiz has it or not? At times, he starts off the game, he's a little out of his mechanics and a little out of whack, but he regains his composure, gets back and makes pitches and gets out of innings, and uh, I don't think there's one sign that says he's going to be all the way on or all the way off. Uh, right now, it's a struggle for Ramon to, to maintain his mechanics, stay within himself, and like any young pitcher, it's just, it's just part of growing it as, as a pitcher and a, as a competitor. Paul Ortiz is one of the guys here on a younger group of staff. When you look at Jared Washburn and also Scott Schoenweiss, along with Ortiz, these guys have to become the core group of this staff. And right now, when you look at his numbers in, in the scouting report, him great arm, but he still lacks the maturity. He's got to throw his fastball for strikes, which is unusual because usually when pitchers have trouble, it's their breaking stuff that they don't throw over. He's got to really watch his arm angle, and Fabergrass will be on him all day long about how his arm angle is, make sure that he keeps it up in order to throw strikes. Ball one down low to Paul Loduca, a 327 hitter, six home runs, and 19 batted in. And there's strike one and one. Loduca remaining in the leadoff spot, even with Sheffield back. Tom Goodwin nor Marquise Grissom did a very good job in the leadoff role the first month of the year. And then when Sheffield went down, they moved Laduca up at the top, and he's been tearing it up. Although he's cooled off a little bit here of late. I think they, what they like about Laduca is the fact that he will take pitches up there. Marquise Grissom is not a guy that's going to take pitches. He's only walked two times all year in more than 160 at bats. So Laduca at least will take a look. Not great speed, but he's been able to get on base. And here he's worked to count three and one against Ortiz, leading off the LA opening inning. Rezolonic will follow, and then Sheffield. He's been on the DL so long, he's ready to hit right now. Laduca jumps on a 3-1 pitch up in the strike zone and fouls it off, 3-2. That's something that Paul Laduca is, is working on as he's in the major league level, is trying to get on top of that high pitch. A lot of talk this year about the high strike zone. Laduca's not a very tall guy. They listen at 5'10", and I think that's when he's standing on someone's phone book. But book on him is you can get him out upstairs. He's a low ball hitter for a right-hander, which is a little bit unusual. 3-2. And it's ball four, so Laduca takes a walk to begin the Dodger opening inning. Let's take a look at the Anaheim defense behind Ortiz. They'll go with Garrett Anderson in left field. Darren Erstad, a gold glove winner. His first last season is in center. And Tim Salmon, a solid defender in right. Loss and Eckstein have committed 16 errors on the left side. Kennedy and Joyner on the right, only four. And a battery of Ortiz and Fabregas. One of the things that we should look for today out of Ortiz is whether or not he falls in love with that slider. They say that's one of his biggest problems. High drive down the left field line, fair or foul, bending foul, and he hit it a ton. That was not a slider. That was a first pitch fastball, but in the last at bat, we saw Laduca up there, a leadoff hitter, a 3-2 count. You would expect a fastball. He misses with the slider. Tough pitch to lay off when you're up there hitting, but if you're not going to throw that for a strike, when I talked to George Fabergas earlier, he said, guy will fall in love with one pitch and want to keep using it and using it and not use his other pitches. Breaking ball there, and it stays high. One and one on Grezolani.
The Dodgers by no means a running team, although they figure to start stealing more bases as the season goes on when they can get Goodwick on track, swing and a miss on a breaking ball. And Beltre will run more. But Goodwin's a guy they really ultimately like to have back leading off. Well, the old adage, you can't steal first base, and that's not a real knock on Goodwin, but he has struggled earlier on. His on-base percentage is not good. He's not been able to get on base in order to steal anything. So he's been in and out of the lineup, which also doesn't help. One and two on Breslin. And a swing and a miss. Another off-speed pitch by Ortiz, and he has his first strike out of the game. Yeah, I like that right there as you see Reguilon past Sheffield. It's nice when the veteran players will share information. He just told Sheffield what pitch that was that he just saw right there and how Sheffield might be able to adjust to it even before he sees it. It's nice when you can get information. That's why, I guess that's why I always liked hitting eighth. Not only because I wasn't a very good hitter, but I got to see seven guys go up there before me. I might have a better idea when I got there. You had all the inside info by that point. A lot of times I, I got to see everybody go up there and hit because I wasn't actually playing. <laughs> now Gary Sheffy just activated off the disabled list before the game last night. I've been taking batting practice here in L.A. for the last three days, and they proclaimed him fit to go. Sheffield's such a smart hitter. Last night they were throwing him sliders away, and all he does is move up on the plate a little bit better and make that an inside pitch. You better get it way in on Sheffield or else you're going to have big time problems because perhaps the quickest bat on pitches inside, maybe in all of baseball. And it's amazing, too, and we sat there and talked to him yesterday, and you can understand why. I mean, the guy, the guy has arms as big as our legs. He's so, so strong, but you'd never teach a kid to hit the way he does with all that bat movement because it's so tough to get it back to the hitting zone. Swing and a miss, and Ortiz goes away from him for strike three. We talked about the slider from Ortiz. This is a great angle of it. You see Sheffield out in front of it, out on his front leg. Rarely happens to Sheff. Look at him bailing out of there. That's one of those plays where your heart was in it, but your rear end wasn't. And usually when you have a play like that, you end up going and sitting down on that rear end right where it was pointing in the dugout. And you know, Steve, it's going to take Sheffield a while to get back to the timing at the plate against live major league pitching, right? No question. You sit around for a couple weeks, 15 days like he did on the DL. It's very tough to get back in there, but he is such a good player and such a, an influence in the lineup. They'd rather have a bad Gary Sheffield in the lineup, take the chance that he might pop a home run out, go one for four with a big hit, or just change the complexion of the way they have to defend you. Anytime you see Chef coming to the plate, you're worried about it. Sean Green, a red-hot hitter for the Dodgers over the last two weeks, has hit 339 with six homers and 20 runs batted in. One ball and one strength. And I love the way Green responded to Jim Tracy's challenge of this guy needs to step it up. And since Sheffield went on the DL in those 13 games. He hit 345. He hit six home runs. He drove in 20. That is accepting a challenge. Check swing. Did he go? They have field down at third. And yes, says Jerry Meal. Green can't believe it. He's behind one and two. There you go. You look at the those numbers since Chef went down and his manager called him out and said, hey, I need more production out of you. We brought you here to be one of the guys in the middle of the lineup that's supposed to produce, and I needed to have it happening right now. And a lot of times, a superstar player might sulk or say, why are you talking about me in the media that way? I'm doing the best I can. No, kept his mouth shut, went out and did his job, and did exactly what his manager needed from him. Loduca started the inning by drawing a walk. Ortiz's fan, Grezelonic, and Sheffield since. 2 2. Swing and a miss, and Ortiz fans aside in the opening inning. We go to the second in Los Angeles. No score. Jim Tracy leaning hard on Chan Hole Park these days. He will throughout the year, but especially so without Kevin Brown, who's on the DL. And Park delivers ball one to Wally Joyner, who leads off the Anaheim second inning. No score in the game. One and one. 
We mentioned how much Park has matured, and we talked to manager Jim Tracy about it yesterday. Early in the season last year, uh, Chad Cruder hooked up with him. Davey decided to have Cruder catch him one day, and they just seemed to click together. And all we've seen from that point forward is just growth uh, on his part, uh, an understanding of, of him as far as what Chad's trying to do. Uh, we, we've seen a tremendous growth in this guy uh, from a maturity standpoint. And I think it's worth pointing out that when guys hook up like that together as, as a team, pitcher and catcher, it's important to understand why it's clicking. And I think more than anything else, We've talked a lot about it over the last few years with this Dodger ball club of the different personalities and different cultures that are on this team. Cruder and Chan Ho Park really have a good working understanding of what pitch they want to throw at what point in time, where Park isn't having to shake off a bunch of different pitches. He, they work well together and, and want to work the same way together. Well, we mentioned early that one of the real keys for Park is just throwing strikes, and that already is his yeah, second walk place. of the afternoon. George. Well, that at bat right there with Wally Joyner, I would disagree with the way they pitched him after we just talked about how they're on the same page. I would not be throwing Wally Joyner away anymore. In his earlier days with the Angels, when it was Wally World and he was hitting home runs in the right field bleachers all the time, that was fine. But now he's more of an opposite field hitter. I'd try to get in on him. Fabregas puts down the bunt. Park's going to second for one. The relay throw is not going to be in time. A hard, clean slide by Joyner taking out Cora at second base, preventing the double play. Uh, just great instincts by Park, and here comes Joyner. Been in the game a long, long time. He knows his job is to take somebody out at second base, make sure that you can't get off a good throw in order to turn over a double play on a bunt. Joyner's only thought right now is, I got to get somebody down here. Good hard slide, cleats a little bit up. Good thing he got his toes in there instead of the, the underside of his foot. He might have a little argument down there from Alex Cora. And I tell you, when I, when I would get on first base, I had two thoughts in my mind. The first one was, please get a hit. I want to score. But if you don't get a hit, ground out to the shortstop because I want to get me a second baseman down there. That's right. the way the game's played. It's either get a hit or make it fun for me on my way back to the dugout. Now Adam Kennedy and a little flare in the right field, a base hit. Fabregas making a turn. He'll advance on to third. Kennedy slams on the break. So the Angels have him on the corners with only one out. Pitcher. Kennedy, a good, solid player since coming over from the Cardinals prior to last year. And, you know, good hitters get jammed, Tommy. I mean, this ball is way in on his hands, but he does a pretty good job of getting them through. And even though the ball is beating him here, it's not like he's panicking and said, oh, I got to go out around the ball. Kept his hands in. This ball gets jammed and, and ends up being a hit. You know, you don't have to hit it right on the nose every time in order to get hits. And I'll tell you what, if Kennedy's dad is watching the game somewhere today, great for him. If he's not watching it tomorrow's paper, it looks like he hit a line drive. A missile for crying out loud. That's right. A bullet. Well, now a meeting at the mound. The Dodgers defensively have to be feeling as though Ortiz is going to be asked to butt. This will be his first at bat of the season. Well, this is more a conversation with the infielders rather than it was about Chan Ho Park. They got to figure out how they're going to defend this and what they're going to do. I think Ortiz, you know, with the guy at third base, you have to worry about whether or not he's bunting. It becomes a safety squeeze if he is. If he can get it down, then maybe you can score. If he's not bunting and swinging away, in this case, you got to, the guy on third base has got to make the ball get through, and the middle infielders defensively need to know what they're doing with the ball. And right now, it looks like they're going to try to turn the double play. Reaping in at third is Adrian Beltre and a stab at the ball, and he's down a strike. Well, Ortiz there, unless someone had a little conversation with him, is smarter than most National League pitchers when it comes to this considering he's an American League pitcher. If he is going to bunt the ball, you have to bunt the ball to the right side because LaDuca still has to hold the runner on, and Beltre does not. Runners on the corners, only one away, and Park will send the Kennedy back to the bag. Adam with five stolen bases and eight attempts on the year. The old 
Jack McDowell move that only works for Jack McDowell. Well, because he sold it. Yes, he did. He did a great job of the fake to third base, and his, his delivery was exactly the same. 0-1 oh, to Ortiz. No sign of a bun here. A swing and a miss. Now park ahead of the Anaheim pitcher. No balls, two strikes. Now here's a great shot from the blimp where you look at Beltre from here. Can come in and charge much better than Laduca because he's got to hold the runner on over here. Can't just let him go. So he's a late charge. So you bunt the ball this way in order to make sure that if you're going to bunt, that's where the ball has to be placed. That's your best opportunity for success. Well, Ortiz choked up about six and a half inches on the bat before <laughs> that two-strike pitch and is able to foul it away. You know, at, at that point, I mean, once again, we're going to talk about this every week when we see a National League game or an a American A real League game. Dish. Yes. I'll tell you what. Did you see that swing? I've seen better cuts <laughs> under a Band-Aid. I'd go back to bumming if I was him. Look at him choking up, though. He's acting like he knows what he's doing. Well, that's what a guy's supposed to do, right? You get two strikes and all of a sudden choke up and just put the bat on the ball? Well, the key part there would be put the bat on the ball. I hear you. He is shaking in his boots right there. There's a good look at Valdez, who came from the National League, saying, go ahead, go get him. Swing and a miss. He missed that ball by a foot. And Clark has his second strike out of the afternoon, two away in the inning. Hey, that's why it is tough and why you have more strategy in the National League, because this is painful to watch. David. That ball's a foot and a half outside, but we're trying to hit it. Out on the front foot. Boy, that brings back bad memories of my own swing. Well, I mean, you took a, an earful last weekend with Scott Ellerton <laughs> and Shane right. Reynolds. That's right. I better be learning. I got to learn to be quiet about those guys. But come on. Did you see that? It's just so tough when you have to, especially in interleague play, I think it definitely gives the advantage to the National League teams because even though I don't think their pitchers are that adept at what they're doing up there, at least they work on bunning and moving guys over, and they do go to the plate. Ortiz was shaking in his boots up there. Ball one low and away. You know, it is interesting that since 97, the American League pitchers have out hit the National League pitchers for some reason. There you get a look at Eckstein and boy, what a rookie year he's having. They moved him from second base to shortstop when they realized De Sarcina would be out for the year, and he has done a solid job. And I'm sure every one of those second place rankings are because of Ichiro. Oh, yeah. Up there in Seattle, who's having a tremendous rookie year. And some would criticize the rookie status. I say, has he ever played here before? No, he's a rookie. I don't care where you come from. Until you play in this caliber of baseball, you're a rookie. And he's certainly proven that he can do. Runners on the corners, two away, two and zero oh to Eckstein, and a breaking ball on a two-zero -oh pitch from Park paints the inside corner. That's a beautiful pitch to a right-handed batter to paint the inside edge with a breaking ball. Wow! Especially to a guy that you don't consider to be a power guy. It's the power guys that you definitely want to get in and bury inside so they can't get their big arms extended. This is a guy who's going to slap the ball around on you. It's a gutsier pitch to go in there. Sellout crowd on hand here at Dodger Stadium for this Saturday afternoon battle. The freeway series between the Angels and the Dodgers. The Angels getting a 1-0 win here last night. No score today. 2-1 on X time. Lined into right center field on the run. Grissom, he'll get. And what a play by Grissom, the four-time Gold Glove winner in center. The Angels left two on in the opening inning, and Grissom strands two in the second inning. We remind you next week on Fox Saturday Baseball, presented by Radio Shack, the A's take on Barry Bonds and the Giants in a battle for the Bay Area bragging rights with the Rangers and the Astros in Texas. It all begins with this week in baseball next Saturday. 12:30 Eastern and Pacific. All right, look at the replay of this of this catch by Gresham. And the thing that I want you to watch is watch how he lands. Lands on his hands. And this isn't an all-out dive, but you land on your hands so that you don't lose the ball. A lot of outfielders, when they dive for a ball, they land on their elbow. It hits that ulnar nerve or something in there, and your hand opens up and you lose the ball. Four-time gold glove winner. Anytime you catch the ball land on your hands when you're diving. Watch him. And this is a stumble, but he still knows. If he hits his elbow, 
His hand opens up and he might lose that ball. He lands on his hands first and ends up hanging on the ball, making a great play. That's why they do that thing when you go to the doctor's office, when they take that thing and bang on your knee and your leg reflexes. Same yeah. thing you're saying when you land on that elbow. Exactly right. Pretty sure that's not your ulnar nerve down there <laughs> in your knee, though. <laughs> well, you're right about that. 3-0 on Grissom. What a job he did. Unless maybe you have Tommy John surgery or right. something, and it ends up in places where it's not supposed well, to be. Well, can happen. <laughs> yes. But Grissom, in the 15 games that he started in left field in place of Sheffield, hit 318. As he looks at a strike, hit five home runs, knocked in 12. And more importantly, the Dodgers went, you see, 10 and 3 in that stretch without Gary Sheffield. 3 and 2 now on Grissom, who really is healthy for the first time in years. Unlike the Dodger ace right now, Kevin Brown, he has to sleep every night wearing a neck brace. Well, you get a lot of good sleep wearing one of those things. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I just saw him yesterday in the clubhouse, and he's huge. Oh, it's huge. Line drive, left field. Anderson at the wall, and it's up against it. Grissom motoring into second base, and he will beat the throw. Grissom with his eighth double of the year, and it begins a Dodger second inning. Oh, Marquise Grissom has still got so much to give. Watch this pitch. This is a mistake pitch. Look at the location right out over in the middle. And Grissom just hammers it. And watch how quickly he gets out of the box here. He knows he's hit it hard, but he knows he doesn't get a double unless he busts the entire way. This is a ball that got hammered off the left field wall. Garrett Anderson was back there very quickly. Good throw into second. You've got to have some speed, and you have to have more than speed. You have to have hustle out of the box in order to get a double on that play. Now Adrian Beltre hitting it 221. Four homers, nine driven in. And he shoots it into right field, shallow right field. Salmon coming on, won't get it. Advancing on to third is Grissom. So here come the Dodgers. Runners on the corners and nobody out. Well, it might be uh, the Marquise Grissom day because watch what he does at second base. Holds his position. He's not even halfway. Waiting to see if the ball drops. He knows if it drops, it can go to third base. If the guy catches the ball, he's not going anywhere. So why tag up? Another veteran move and a great base running. You know, you sit around, you watch these teams, you look at the veterans on the team, you look at the younger players. If you're a younger player who's not playing right now because that guy is better than you, you have to learn from what they do on the field. Well, Don Zimmer, who's been around baseball in uniform for almost 55 years, has been often quoted saying that good base running and bad base running over the course of the year will win you or lose you more games maybe than any other area. And you know what? Bad base runners never get thrown out. You know why? Because they never take a chance. Now Cruder, and he takes outside and high, ball one. Now, good base runners occasionally will get thrown out, and that's okay. You need to be aggressive. You just need to know when to take your chances and when to back off. Grissom started the inning with a double. Advanced to third on a blue single to right by Beltre. Nobody out. Dodgers were shut out here in the game last night. And the 1-0. Dribbled foul behind the plate. For the first time this year, we bring in catcher Cam, and we thank George Fabregas of the Anaheim Angels for wearing it today, and there you get a look. I'll tell you what, this catcher cam is so much fun. It almost makes the game look like a video game back there. But, you know, since I've sat up here in the booth, I would have been so much better player because it looks so much easier up here. Doesn't look so easy from right there, though, does it? No. Fabregas, if we showed it now, he'd probably be giving us a good look at the blimp. Too late. on target weather alert. Good afternoon, everyone. We wanted to let you know about a tornado warning for north central Lincoln County, and this is going to be until 315 this afternoon. Once again, a warning, not a watch. A warning means tornadoes have been spotted, and from what we understand, several tornadoes have been reported with this particular storm. The last sighting was about six miles north of Genoa. So if you're in the area of north central Lincoln County, we're asking that you please uh, go to a very safe level of your home, basically the basement or any building that is reinforced. If you can't go into a building, the best thing to do is to get in a ditch or a low-line area and cover your head. Once again, 
Several tornadoes have been reported in north central Lincoln County, and the tornado warning is extended until 315. Uh, we're here in the Weather Center at Fox 31, and we will certainly keep you posted on the latest of what's going on. This has been a special Fox 31 News Flash. We now return to regular programming. The two-time Gold Glove winning second baseman with Cincinnati. And the rumor mainly involves the Dodgers. Reese has been playing shortstop. His original position of late with Barry Larkin on the DL. Boy, how would Reese fit in the Dodger lineup? Pokey Reese would fit in anybody's lineup. One of the most impressive defensive players and just a very smooth player, both offensively and defensively. And you look at that team with the Reds that they have right now. I mean, that's a double A team they're firing out there every day. There are some guys that you don't even recognize their name. And it's very tough. There's a guy that once was untouchable in that organization. Ball one to Chano Park. Four hits and 30 at bats. In RBI, he has a pair of doubles. One nothing Dodgers here in the bottom half of the second inning. Swing and a miss one and one. Park has always had minor back trouble. And in two of the last three years, he has sparked the problems by swinging the back. He swings so hard that every now and again, he'll pull the back just out of whack. Fouled out of play, one ball, two strikes, and that's what he did, as we mentioned earlier, in his last start against Arizona. They thought he was going to have to come out of the game. Park took a pretty healthy swing at the fastball, not such a good swing at the slider. We talked about Ortiz and how much he loves his slider. I don't anticipate Park seeing another fastball unless it's under his chin. Hit down the right field line. It drops in front of Sam in a base hit. And Cora, with two away running all the way, advances on to third. And see, that's just a mistake, Tom, because that's exactly what they were trying to do. Bust him off the plate with a fastball in. Look where Fabergas is sitting. He wants that ball in off the plate. From catcher cam, you see the angle. And Park just does, once again, another really good job of pulling his hands in in order to get the head of the bat through the zone. And now he's saying, where did it go? And down the right field line for a little bloop hit, which is exactly what you expect out of a pitcher. Those pitchers can swing that bat, brother. That was a bullet into right field. But that's the mistake by the pitcher right there. He had no chance on his slider, and he threw him another fastball that was hittable. Well, now LaDuca has been a 556 hitter with runners in scoring position, and he takes high for ball one. And this Tom, is one area where they really like LaDuca batting in a leadoff spot because he's more of a run producer than good one. And this is where it can really hurt you having the pitcher get a hit in that situation with two outs. You get him out, you clean off the bases, you come in and hit. Now you're looking at more runs for the possibility of it. Down the left field line towards the corner. Foul and out of play. Here's what we see Paul Latuka doing right here. Watch his back come around the ball. We saw, we just saw Chan Ho Park pull his hands through the hitting zone, whereas Latuka in that case almost came around that swing, and that's why he hooked that ball foul. If he could have kept his hands inside the ball and pulled him through the hitting zone, letting the bat head drag a little bit, he would have kept that ball fair and maybe gotten a double out of it. One one on Laduka. And a fastball sails away, and it's two balls and a strike. This game is pretty much indicative of Ortiz's very young career. His last start, he was spectacular against Kansas City. And now the next start, making silly mistakes. He's only behind one nothing. But the base hit a moment ago to Chan Old Park. You just can't have it happen. You saw how he dominated with the strikeout pitch in the first as well. Two and two. Boy, and he has Superman-like stuff. I mean, he throws hard. And there you get a look at the numbers for Ortiz in his game against Kansas City. Swing and a miss, and that'll end the inning. Dodgers lead 1-0. You're watching Fox Sports, home of the 2001 All-Star Game. Back after this break from your local station.
Today's aerial coverage being provided by Monster.com. The Monster.com blimp. Also a proud sponsor of the 2002 Olympic Winter Games and the 2002 U.S. Olympic team. Monster.com. Glad to have them with us here today. That's how you uh, got this job, from a studio to the booth, by logging on to Monster.com. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. I said, who's the biggest monster that I could work with? And I ended up with you. <laughs> oh, wow. There is the Monster.com blimp in its all orangeness. You can't miss that thing, can you? Well, it tends to be a, a little smoggy here. Looks like a fog light. Now Ramon Ortiz allowed four base hits, but only one run in the Dodgers' second inning. So he'll try and cool down, jacket on and all. As we begin the third inning, heart of the order, Darren Erstad, Troy Gloss, and then Tim Salmon against Chan Ho Park. Now, Darren Erstad, you know when he's healthy, and that's what it's been about this year. I mean, a month ago, he's hitting 204. Right knee, he's got a ligament problem in his right knee, which does not allow him to shift his weight to that knee. He used to be one of the best in the game at sitting back, sitting back, and then exploding to the ball. And it's harder for him to do that when you take the stride and then you have to land and all that weight's on that knee. He's having to readjust at the plate. And that's no fun. When you have a swing that you like, why change it? The only reason he's changing it is because of injury. He overcompensated for that, had a back problem for a while. He, he's, been a, he's been a hurting puppy out there for a lot of the year. But he is a warrior. Kid from North Dakota, former punter on the University of Nebraska in 1994, national championship team, was a great hockey player growing up in North Dakota. Which and is so a state ridiculous. champion in uh, hurdles. Swung and fouled out of play. I mean, he did everything. It was so ridiculous for him to have been the Nebraska punter. Because when you, when you think of a baseball player, you say, yeah, if he played football, he'd probably be the punter. But this guy does not have a punter's mentality. This guy should have been like a nose guard or something. The way he plays the game, if he was any bigger, you know he would have been. I mean, I think he was just trying to find a place to play out there because he had that football mentality, and, and it was a mistake. He told me he was just... You know, as a young player, I mean, I had a confidence to me, but um, I felt like I had to go out and prove it, where he feels like it, it almost... You sense it in his body language, like, you know, there's nothing to prove. I'm better than this guy, you know? And, and that's kind of unique for a young player. And go out there and whack 40 home runs, 49 homers. And that one down the right field line. Foul. That's uh, one area down the right field line and down the left field line here at Dodger Stadium where you can get a quote-unquote cheap. Not only is it 330 feet, but more importantly, that wall down there only about three feet high. I got news for you. If it lands on the other side of the fence, it ain't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you had 19, a guy who had 19 in my career. I got to tell you, if it goes on, the, I don't care if it's scraping the back, the paint off the back of the wall. If it goes out, we're happy about it. Touch them all. That's right. Fastball high from Park. One and one on Troy Gloss, a former UCLA Bruin. Well, it's hard to believe this team, which set a franchise record in home runs last year, that Gloss this year has accounted for 28% of their home runs. Well, that's mainly because Erstad has not been hitting the ball. Garrett Anderson production home run-wise a little bit down this year, and the same thing with Tim Salmon as well. So the emphasis on Gloss's numbers become that much more increased. But I really like what Salmon said about his body language. Gloss is not a guy that walks around and says, I'm better than you. In fact, he's quite the opposite. Wears little glasses, you know, looks like he'd just soon pick up a, a book and read it, then go out and take extra VP. But when he gets into the into the hitter's box, that whole mentality changes. And you can just see it there. He's saying, I can hit you. Ball four, and Gloss has walked for the second time. Right now for the Speed Pass Game Break, brought to you by Mobile. Let's return to Genie's Alaska in the Fox Network Center. Tom, we're going to go around the globe here a little bit. Out at Fenway, Pedro Martinez had a one-hitter until that happened. The big hit by the number nine hitter, Marlon Anderson, put Philly on the board first. They were on the board last. They take it 5-2. Bottom eight bases loaded for Paul O'Neill, but John Rocker had it going on, and he was sharing it as well. The Braves go on to win. Tom? 
Jeannie, thank you very much. And the Braves must have to feel like uh, they have been unleashed getting a win in Yankee Stadium. And I'm pretty sure John Rocker wasn't sticking his tongue out at anyone in particular right there after that strikeout. Well, you would certainly hope not. Although you never know. Ball one down low to Tim Salmon. Boy, that Philadelphia Phillies team. What a surprise Larry Boa's club has been this season. They've lost five of their last six until today. But gained the victory at Boston. Omar Dahl having a marvelous year for Philadelphia. And the 1 0 is at the belt of strike. 1 and 1 is Salmon. Well, Salmon has gotten to the point, and this is really difficult to explain to people when you say to them, he has gotten to the point where he just doesn't care. He's had so many people talking to him about his problems, about his slow start. He said, if you don't get to the point where you don't care anymore, I don't think you can really change anything. And the toughest part about it is the fact that he does care. He loves this game. He gets paid to play it. He's a, you know, he's a very even-keeled kind of guy. But he, he said he had so many guys talking to him about his problems. He said he got off to a slow start because he didn't get very many at-bats in spring training. And then he thought he had to make up for Mo Vaughn not being in the lineup. He said, I just had to get to the point where I could just take myself away from it and just tell everyone else to get away from me. I, I will be fine as long as I just start concentrating on what I need to do. It's like the old adage, if I if I tell you not to do something, it's the only thing in your mind while you're trying to do the, the reverse of what I told you not to do. You might have to explain that to me again between innings. There's a fly ball in a short left field and Sheffield there to get it to a what? Had the same situation a few years back with Robin Ventura when he had made like 14 errors mm -hmm. in the first 27 games. Well, he said, I, I had to get to the point where I could catch the ball, look over at first and say, I don't even care if I throw this ball into the seats because I have to react as an athlete instead of thinking about so many things. And you know I'm going to say it, my favorite saying in the game, no brain, no headache. If you just don't think about things and go out and react and be an athlete and play the game that you know how to play, you're so much better off. Two down. Loss over at first to Dodgers with a 1-0 lead, and here comes Garrett Anderson. He left 2-1, ending the first inning by popping up to Grezzolani, and there's strike one. Steve mentioned earlier, Garrett just gets better and better every single season. Hit 35 home runs last year, knocked in 117, both of those career high. Fly ball into center field. Grissom waving off all comers, and that'll do it in the Anaheim third. One man left. The Angels have stranded five, and they trail one nothing. Big play last night, Anaheim, a one nothing victory, and today the Dodgers with a one nothing lead after two and a half. Rezalonic, Sheffield, and Green do up against Ramon Ortiz. Rezalonic struck out his first time up and looks at a strike on the outside corner. Yeah, I didn't like that one either. Yeah, Rezalonic's a, you know, he just, he's a guy that you, for some reason, easily forget about. He's got eight home runs this year, which ties his career high already. This is a guy. Slow roller, will he beat it out? No, pretty good play there by Ortiz. So now it'll be Gary Sheffield coming up. Gary Sheffield. Sheffield struck out his first time up. You know, Steve, you go back to spring training and everything that took place with Gary Sheffield and Allegedly uh, tore into some of his teammates as he grounds down to third and Gloss with a strong arm before him. But Jim Tracy really set the tone by pulling Sheffield once he arrived in camp in the same room in the same office with some of the other guys who were upset with Sheffield and made him talk everything out. Sheffield talked about that meeting with his teammates yesterday. Oh, they stepped up more than I did. They came to me individually and as a group and said, you know, we don't care what trades are out there, whoever they bring in here, we don't care if they bring in a Barry Bonds or, or whoever or Sammy Sosa, we want you. And, and when they said that, that was very touching to me because it was like, 
you know, now, you know, I have a group of guys that know what I represent. They know I put it on the line every day. Well, you know, it, it's funny because around the game of baseball, I think Gary Sheffield sometimes gets the reputation of a whiner, a guy that, that's a bad influence on his team. Which, and nothing could be further th from the truth. I mean, especially since he's, when he went down to Florida and he became one of the leaders of that team, and when he came here to Los Angeles, he's been one of the mainstays here. And, you know, there was some talk. He made a comment about wanting to be a lifetime Dodger and getting a lifetime contract out of him. And when they balked at that, I think he, he mentioned something. Well, wait a minute. You want to throw around the kind of money that you gave to Darren Dreifert, but you don't want to take care of me. It's tough to make those comparisons when you're talking about your teammates. Green hits it down to left field line, and it's out of play. Sometimes, guys, you know, even though he's trying to make a, a money comparison to his deal to some of the other guys on the team, when they start hearing their names, they, they can take it personally. And there, there was some bad some bad blood going on there. And the worst thing you can do is insult your teammates. As you take a look at Darren Dryford, and I don't think anyone really got to the point where Sheffield didn't let it get personal. Then he stopped it and, and spoke to everybody individually and as a group and said, what's the deal here? Because I want to be here. And, you know, that's that, this whole thing is about me wanting to be here long term. And, uh, and, and Jim Tracy, as you mentioned, held it together like glue. And the more you talk about and to Jim Tracy, the more you like him as a man. Boy, they have found a guy, and it's not to take away anything from Davey Johnson, who was an outstanding manager. But I guess if there is such a thing as the current manager in professional sports, not only baseball, this is a guy who's willing to sit down can finesse a situation, can play hard ball in a situation if he has to. He's just a very sharp, perceptive guy. Fly ball left center, and Erstad is there, and Ramon Ortiz breezes through the third. His first perfect inning. One nothing Dodgers. We go to the fourth. What is that? The final Kirk, game. That's the Kirk Gibson bobblehead doll there. Yeah. They're giving them out today. When are they going to have the Steve Lyon? Well, bobblehead game. If you just shave that mustache off the Kirk Gibson bobblehead doll, it would be me, or it'd be Eric wait, wait Harris, or if you just, you know, get a little brown paint on there, it could be the Barry Larkin bobblehead doll. It's <laughs> the same doll. Popped up a lot of foul territory here in Los Angeles, and room for Beltran. The joiner fouls out to begin the Anaheim fourth inning with Anaheim trailing the Dodgers one nothing. They take the cap off of him and show a little curly hair. It's the Tom Brenneman. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now here's the pitch by pitch to Joiner. That ball's inside a little slider there, and then again inside. Remember his first at bat, they pitched him away. And I said, I, and I still think that that's the wrong way to pitch Joiner at this point. You pitch him away, you're coming right into his strengths. He loves to hit the ball the opposite field these days. Joiner retired to open up the fourth. And now it's George Fabregas who bounced into a fielder's choice trying to bunt while he joined her to second base in the second inning. Hart clearly not on top of his game early on. He's walked three batters. He's only allowed two hits. But the Angels have had scoring chances. They've already left five men on base. And a soft liner into center field, a base hit by Fabregas. But again, part of that maturation process of Park. A lot like his last start in Arizona, less than his best. So far two. today, good enough for no Kennedy. runs. Kennedy. A couple of the hits that he's given up have been quite like that one, jamming guys, getting them off at the end of their bat. And you're talking about just a matter of an inch or so that would get that so far in on Fabregas' hands that he wouldn't have the strength to hit it that far and you get an out out of it. So he's not far from having a good outing here and he's the kind of guy that if you don't get to him early when you have your chances we get a little bit stronger a little bit better confidence breaking balls will start being a little bit sharper in the middle innings and then you're not going to be able to score on him. Adam Kennedy looks at a fastball high and away Kennedy the St. Louis Cardinals 99 minor league player of the year he came over in the Jim Edmonds trade last year and had an outstanding rookie campaign. One and one. Let's see if maybe they start thinking about playing a little bit more little ball where you give Kennedy a chance to swing away before he has a strike and then, you know, maybe think about putting on some kind of a play with him, a hit and run to get things going to try to maybe get a first and third situation because you've had your opportunities to score and have it. 
And that is the style of managing by Mike Sosha. He likes that National League small ball sort of play. Fabregas isn't going to be a guy that's going to go out and steal a base for you. You're not bunting him a situation with one out. But maybe you put some guys in motion. Kennedy handles the bat pretty well and see what happens. Two and one. That's where it gets to be a lot more interesting to be a middle infielder. Where you look at Cora and, and, and Grezelanik out there in the field where they start crossing up and talking to each other. Grezelanik at second base there will look for the sign from Cora to see who's covering the bag in the steal situation, and they'll probably cross up. Turned on that pitch, hit it down the right field line and foul. Well, my philosophy, and I rarely played short, but I played a lot of second base, was if I'm the shortstop and I'm the guy given the signs, if Fabregas is running, it's a hit and run because he's not trying to steal the base. He's not going to be stealing because he's not fast enough. So I would cross up, which means that uh, if with a left-handed hitter Kennedy up there, normally the shortstop would cover the bag because he's more likely to pull the ball to the second baseman. You'd have the second baseman cover the bag because he's trying to hit the ball the other way on a hit and run. Two and two. And you figure that's the kind of thing as a second baseman. Breslonic would certainly be aware of that, maybe more so than a youngster core. So we're having veteran players in your infield. And of course, Breslonic played shortstop last year. Had the highest average for a shortstop in the last 63 years with his 326 average. Those are the kind of things that you forget about a guy like him. And hit with a pitch on the 2 2 is Kennedy. Clearly not what Park had in mind. So Fabregas goes to second. Kennedy on his first. And the pitcher coming up. Kennedy, a great move here. Watch the effort to try to get out of the way, which would be little or none. Turns into it. Says, hey, I'll take one off my shin for the team right here. Now it hurts. But he says right here, he said, why should I get out of the way on this? When I'm down in the count, I have two strikes. I'm going to be standing on first place. And we all know that if we get Chan Ho Park in trouble by putting guys on base is where he has a little bit more trouble. You would never do such a thing like that, would you? It hurts too much. You kidding me? I'd be the trainer would be talking to me right now. And he'd be saying, Good job, good job, take one for the team. I'd say, You kidding me? This hurts. Now Ortiz, who squares to butt and pushes it beautifully. Third base side and Park, knowing that Fabregas is running, goes that way and cuts down the league running. That's good awareness out there by Channel Park, knowing who's running. Maybe anybody else on the Anaheim team, he can't throw him out. Fabregas, he does. And it is hard, too, because as Fabregas, he can't just get a great jump. This is a nice bunt, but look at Park, like a cat. He's off of there, makes the decision, listening to his catcher telling him to go to third. Fabregas isn't all that fast, but watch the decision that Beltre has to make. He's got to decide, do I come in and feel the bunt? But then he sees Park all over it. Go back, field your position, get back to the bag. Great play all around by the, the defense of the Dodgers, and that's one area that they're much, much happier with this season than last year, even though the left side of the infield has committed a lot of errors. Overall, much happier with their team defense. Well, now Eckstein with two aboard. He left two on when he lined out to Grissom in right center. This time he drives it into left center, and Grissom cannot get it. One run scores on to third base and waved around is Ortiz. He will score on the throw to the plate. He, and he didn't touch home plate. He, he missed. didn't touch home plate, plate here. He's going to have to. You got to tag him, though. There he goes. And Pretty they good. will tag him, and he's out. How about that? The throw went into second base. They threw to the plate. Ortiz wasn't going to slide. But he missed the plate. Well, we talked about it last week when we had Roy Oswald get his first hit, and we, were, we weren't sure if he knew where home plate was. This time, Ortiz knows where it is, but he decides not to touch it. Wow. Chan Ho Park doing a great job of letting Cruder know that he didn't touch home plate. We are tied at one as we head for the bottom of the fourth. Stop. Stay here at third base. Don't go. Okay, don't go. All right, just stay right here. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I said, stop. Where are you going? And then all the way to home plate is Chad Kruder makes a great play with his left leg as he kind of gives him a little bit of the plate and then takes it away from him. Ortiz thinks he doesn't have to slide. And 
never ends up touching home plate because he had to kind of stutter step, played hopscotch to get to home plate. And now he says, geez, I probably should have tagged it. Now, Cruder's going back. I think at this point he's asking the umpire, do I have to go tag him? He's out of the baseline, right? I'm making a play on him. He should be out. Well, we're tied at one after all that business. Dodgers bat in the bottom half of the fourth inning, and here's Marquise Grissom. Grissom doubled to left field and scored the only Dodger run back in the second inning. And those are the kind of plays that get third base coaches fired, even though they were doing their job. On the ground is short. And next time we'll throw out Grissom, the 14th. In a family of 15 children, we asked him yesterday, is there a downside to having that many brothers and sisters? We get kicked around a lot. Being number 14 out of 15, you get kicked around a lot. So I got kicked around pretty good growing up. So that what makes me a little bit tough now. And with baseball, you learn to share and love for one another. And you got to have that same compassion for your teammates. And um, I think that's why Kind of put those two things together. My family back home in baseball, you got to be a family too. Delightful guy. Oh, the best. And you know there was only 12 chairs at the dinner table, and you had to race somebody to get there to make sure you got something to eat. Well, I bet he won a race or two. That's why he's so fast. Well, we really enjoyed our conversation yesterday with Grissom, who started his career so brilliantly, of course, uh, in Montreal. But the injuries, he was talking about how they've really taken their toll. You get a little older, it's tougher to come back. Well, he had a great deal to prove this year after being really injured the last two and a half, three years up in Milwaukee. Yep. But he is a team guy. On the ground, a short. And again, Eckstein is there and is throwing time to a win. Well, we've given you a little bit of time to answer our Radio Shack trivia question. Who hit the go-ahead home run for the Dodgers in the final game of the 1988 World Series? And he's here today. The Angels hitting coach, Mickey Hatch, game five. He hit 368 in that series. When the Dodgers shocked the baseball world by beating the A's in five games. You see how fast Hatcher was running around the bases? He wanted to get back to the bench before anybody realized that it was him hitting that home run. And in Radio Shack, you've got questions, we've got answers. Two down, nobody on. And it's ball one low and away to Chad Pruder. Well, our old buddy Michael Milken will be stopping by the booth in the fifth inning. He's always come up to see us to kick off the Cap Cure Challenge in the fight against prostate cancer. We'll be visiting with Michael in the fifth. The amount of money that's been raised for that cause and the lives that have been saved. Unbelievable. We and O now on crew. Ortiz starting to settle in a little bit. He's retired six in a row, but he's fallen behind Pruder at three balls and no strike. Three and one. Pruder's the guy you have to go after in this lineup as well. Hitting just 240 on the year. Doesn't have a lot of pop. He's in and out of the lineup. That makes it tougher for him to be very consistent at the plate. And there's ball four. Shortstop, number three. You see the numbers of Ortiz and Alex. what he does right. inning by inning. A little bit stronger in those middle innings, and then when you start getting later in the game, by reason, get a little bit tired. Breaking ball doesn't break as much. Your fastball gets a little higher in the zone. There's a little less zip on it. You start looking over your shoulder for a bullpen mate to come out and help you out. Swing and a miss. Nasty off-speed pitch right there from Ortiz. 0-1 Alex Cora, who singled in the right his only time up. Dodgers scored in the second inning. A double play ball off the bat of Pruder brought in Grissom, who had started the inning with a double, and then next time with a run-scoring single in the Anaheim fourth. There's a roller that comes back fair, and that is an infield hit by Cora. Maybe a play that Gloss ought to wait on a little bit. The runner doesn't figure to try and go from first to third. You saw it go fair. 
foul back there. It could have rolled foul again. This is a great spin on this ball. This is one where they get back to the dugout and they say, a grown man hit that ball? But look at it spin back into fair territory. Now, I, I think you're right, Tommy. If I'm Troy Gloss on that one, I think he thought he had a legitimate play to pick it up and maybe throw somebody out. But I think that ball may have rolled fair if you just don't try to uh, field it. Stop, chase it back to third base. It might have rolled back into foul territory and you start all over. Very close to the line where he picked it up. And for those of you, by the way, wondering about that rule, once the ball rolls foul, if you go over and touch it, it's a foul ball. But if it continues to roll and comes back in fair, it could stay fair all the way until it gets to the third base bag, and now it's an infield hit. Right. The umpire won't call it foul until it goes past the bag. If it hits a rock or does something and bounces back fair, it's a fair ball. That's why as soon as the ball goes foul, a guy will try to touch it, grab it, kick it, do something with it so that it's a foul ball. 1-0 to Chano Park, who singled his first time up. And now 1-1 one one to Park. Well, remember Park got a base hit on a fastball last time, and I said that if he saw a fastball after he got a strike on him, it should be under his chin or backing him off the plate. I would throw him nothing but breaking balls for the rest of this at-bat. That looked like a fastball or maybe a little something off. He took something off there. A breaking ball that never broke, but Park didn't get it. <laughs> a little backup slider, maybe. That's the replay of that. that. That's just a hanging slider right there that he had another pretty good hack at. One, two to Park. And another breaking ball, and it's fouled back out of play. Ortiz listening to you down there, Steve. I'm a smart guy. You get told that frequently, do you? No. No. Nobody listens to me very rarely either, but I'll tell you, he's doing what I think he should be doing here, but the last three breaking balls that he's thrown have not been very sharp. Get this one off the strike zone. Park can be a threat up there if you got a bat in your hands. There it is. That's a better one, and it's strike three. One hit, two men left. We go to the fifth. Angels and the Dodgers even at one. Once again, Major League Baseball's biggest stars will be back at it in the fight against prostate cancer. Now in its sixth season, it's hard to believe that our Cap Cure home run challenge, six years, Michael Milken. Are you surprised it's been that long? No, no. Are we sure would like to get prostate cancer over with, though? And I know, obviously, I mean, you speak from experience. You had to go through that, uh, that dreaded disease yourself. Right, well, one in six men are diagnosed with prostate cancer in America, so unfortunately it's a pretty large group. But we've made a lot of progress with the help of Major League Baseball and Fox Sports. And clearly it's, it's one of those diseases that early detection means so much. Right, awareness has changed considerably, uh, and Major League Baseball has gone a long way. Actually, 70,000 uh, fewer men have passed away than the government had projected over really? the last six, seven years. And much of it's due to new research, but a great deal of it is due to awareness and what Fox Sports has done to bring it to America. Well, I think you're giving a lot of credit to Fox Sports, and, and I know uh, your good friend and Steve's good friend, and one day hopefully my good friend, Rupert Murdoch, is, uh, is watching today. But, I mean, give yourself, uh, uh, Michael, a, a great deal of credit. I mean, you're a man who has brought this certainly uh, in so many ways with the help of other people very much to the forefront uh, as a topic for all American males and males throughout the entire world and to put this program together with baseball and a lot of the managers and a lot of the players. How much money now have you raised in the six We've years? We've raised 30, in five years more than $30 million. And that's what it really comes down to. You, you can uh, do the lip service, you can talk about awareness, but it really does come down to the amount of money that's spent and generated in order to find a cure or to, or to, to make people aware of what's going on out there and, and to make it a better and maybe a a problem that goes away someday. Well, you know, it's interesting. This is my 29th year in funding breast cancer research. And I knew a lot about breast cancer, melanoma, brain tumors. I knew almost nothing about prostate cancer when I was diagnosed in 1993. And when I was given 12 to 18 months uh, to live back there in 93, it's great to be at a ball game with you, and both in 2001. Now, Steve, Third you know, baseman, number 25. these are uh, interesting opportunities Ross. here because usually your partner's partner gets a manager's job shortly after <laughs> I appear in the booth here. 
Uh, there's going to be a few jobs opening up next year, I think, too. Well, Bob was in the booth with Tom last year, and uh, next thing we knew, Arizona saw him, and he was offered that manager's job. Well, whatever general manager sees me and wants to offer me a managing job, got to fire him on the spot. <laughs> By well, the way, we put up that number a moment ago, and, and individuals can make a pledge to the home run challenge. And we'll give you that number here in just a moment. You saw it a short while ago. It's 1-800-547-CURE. And the Milken Family Foundation will ensure that 100%, and this is really key, 100% of the money, Michael, of all the donations goes to the research, right? That, that is correct. You know, it's interesting. It was only a decade ago when some of the country's best and brightest scientists were told if they went into cancer research, it would be career suicide, that there wasn't enough funding of cancer research, and they should go into some other field. There was more money for heart disease or other things. And we've made a tremendous progress as a country in, in providing it, and so young PhD candidates, scientists, doctors today, if they choose to go in the field of cancer research, greatly because of these events, there's enough money for them to give them a great opportunity. And, and Michael, isn't that one of the greatest criteria that people look for if they want to donate to a program is how much of their dollars are actually going to fund the research when when it's, it's not that way in a lot of cases. Sometimes you, you'll donate money and, and very little of it ends up going to where you want it to go. Well, I think that's what we've seen in a lot of programs. Uh, Milken Family Foundation has funded over a thousand programs, and we try to look at those charities as to what percent goes to where you, you want it to go, and that's why there are no expenses. In fact, there's not only no expenses, when you give a dollar, we'll match that dollar. So you get two dollars working. But it's a beautiful day here in Los Angeles, and when you look at this crowd, of 50 some odd thousand a day, and you realize that 70,000 less American men than the National Institute of Health have projected in the American Cancer Society have passed away. Less have passed away from prostate cancer in the last few years. It's more than fills this stadium. Building. And so many of those here today, perhaps a father sitting with their, their son or daughter or a brother or perhaps, you know, somebody's grandfather who's here today. Well, that's one of the great things about baseball, being able to share some of these kinds of days with your granddad. Well, that's, that was the theme, you know, keep dad in the game and those those uh, public service announcements that Mark McGuire and his dad did for us were great. Uh, the leading home run hitter for us in this program is Alex Karras. He's hit 10 home runs. He's raised more than a half million dollars just by himself. Eric Karras, excuse me. And I came out earlier to see it. Eric. Number Make sure 15. he was in good shape for next week. Yeah, yeah they, they got to have him ready. Get him off the disabled list. Been bothered with a bad back. And Eric watching right now is all of a sudden uh, Channel Park has run into trouble to begin this fifth inning. A base hit and now a walk. And they have two on with nobody out in a 1-1 game. Yes. And folks, I'd like to remind you, you don't have to have a lot of money to help in our Cap Cure Home Run Challenge. I mean, we accept pledges from 25 cents. You know, up to as much as you want to give $10,000 if you're able to do that. But even if you just have a little bit of money to try and help, it is greatly appreciated. We have averaged about 160 home runs so last year. But over the years, it's been about 130. So 25 cents is the, is, is the equivalent for 30 or 40 dollars for us. And a dollar might be 130, 140 dollars. And everyone can pitch in here. And one of the key things is to go get checked. Tell your dad, tell your uncle, tell your friend to go get checked. Oh, one pitch, and it's up and in to Tim Salmon. One ball and one strike. Well, Park has been a little wild today, and he's been fabulous in Dodger Stadium this year. Great record at home, no question about it. Almost unbeatable here. Well, you're a big baseball fan, aren't you, Michael? Well, I've seen all the ballparks. Have you really? Oh, yeah, great right. ballparks as we travel around the country. My record is uh, three baseball games in one day. <laughs> what city <laughs> was that in? Do. Well, we started uh, in Atlanta, went up to Philadelphia, and then I headed west and caught the game on the West Coast. We almost had four in one day. There was a morning-afternoon doubleheader in Miami, but it was rained out in the morning. We had to move on. That so you get to see a, a day. You get to see a lot of ballparks, and today is just a beautiful day here in Los Angeles. I notice we have the big sign up there, Think Blue, today. 
Well, the Dodgers were shut out by these Angels last night. It's a 1-1 game here today. And Salmon now wanting timeout. Tim Salmon is the representative in the home run cap cure challenge that begins on June the 13th and runs through June the 20th. You know, the players have been just phenomenal over the years here. Salmon gone on strikes, first out of the inning. And Salmon is typical of it. You, know, you have a lot of different opinions of athletes when you read the newspapers. When you really get to know them and what they do for all types of charities and communities. We started this program with uh, Mark McGuire and Ken Griffey. Alex Rodriguez joined in and Derek Jeter. And so you find you know, many of the best players or the leading players in the teams have been represented in this effort. Now Garrett Anderson steps up there with two on and only one out. You see what the Angels have done with runners in scoring position today. The only base hit was David Eckstein back in that fourth inning. And this has a chance to be two. There's one and that's a double play. Thank you. Michael, it's been great seeing you again. Thank Thanks you. so much for coming by. Glad you're doing well. Good. Thanks, Great Dave. to see you again. We go to the bottom half of the fifth at Dodger Stadium. We're tied at one. to pay. LaDuca. Well, Channel Park on the ropes here. The first two reach in the inning in a big double play ball off the bat of Anderson. The key to that play right there is the way Grezzalana catches and flips the ball and then follows the throw. That's a real easy throw to have hook on your finger and end up throwing that ball into center field. He does a great job of putting it. It's a very difficult play to make. Look at the way he follows the ball, gets his momentum, and that lets the shortstop, Alex Coro right there, have a great vision of the ball coming towards him. It's a tough play to make, and I'll tell you what, you talk about the pitcher's best friend, especially when you're going through the heart of the angel order, and you could get yourself in some big trouble. Well, the Dodgers now have a top of the air order against Ramon Ortiz. Paul LaDuca has walked and struck out 0 for 1. And he thought about it. Did he go? They appeal and no, says Mark Barron. Wow, you remember the old distinction in the umpires. As you look at the numbers for Ortiz there and the balls and strikes, used to be if you took your bat off the shoulder in a National League game, it was a strike. There was no such thing as a check swing. American League guys got away with so much more. Now, of course, the umpires, there's no distinction between National League, American League. They're all together. So sometimes you'll get a favorable call from a former American League umpire who usually gives the guy a little bit more leeway on a check swing. Upstairs now three and one on low Duca will be followed by Grezelonic and then Gary Sheffield here in the Dodger fifth inning one run five hits for the Angels they've left seven on base one run five hits no errors five stranded by the Dodgers and it's pulled foul three and two on low Duca. I think this is the time of the year, Tom, where you're really going to see what type of player LaDuca is. Hit 300 almost every year in the minor leagues. Got off to a great start here. He's been kind of a feel-good story for the Dodgers, but the honeymoon's over now. Now it's time for him to produce and the way he has in the past. Hitting way over 300 right now. This is the time where you find out if he's really going to be a solid major leaguer. Popped up, short right field. Backpedaling is Adam Kennedy. One away, and it's time as always to take a look at our multi award winning rendition of the AW fan cam. Bring in the Beach Boys, please. Orchestra, strike it up. Ah, uh, yes. California girls. I mean, you're an L.A. guy now. Drive around with the top down. Yes, I do. All the gals checking you out, I'm sure. I don't think so. <laughs> it's a great car. They just don't like who's driving. <laughs> I understand. Believe me. One down as Grezelanek, who came in with a 10-game hitting streak, steps up there. He's 0 for 2 today. here at home for Greg Zalonik. Only one on the road. As we mentioned, he has eight now, which ties his career high already. He told me that he's just being so much more aggressive at the plate than he used to be. And he went around. They appeal on a check swing on Greg Zalonik. 
They didn't ring up Laduca. They do get the veteran Grezolani. Well, as we said in the National League, you take your bat off the shoulder, usually it's a strike. He gets that one out there. It was definitely an attempt at the ball and from a different angle. If you're playing third base, you're thinking, yeah, he's trying to hit it. That's a strike. I'm not sure I've ever seen a batter in recent years who is better at holding up on that swing than Mark Grace. Longtime Chicago Cub, now, of course, in his first year with Arizona. As you know what Grace does is he'll he'll swing it as far as he was swinging and, and then he'll leave it there for you to take a good look. He, a look at it. He doesn't try to fake you out by pulling it back saying oh I didn't swing. He just he gets out there he stops it and he says hey you make the determination now did I swing or not. I think that gives the umpires a better look at it and they say hey he didn't go. Now Sheffy representing a go ahead run and it's blown away two balls at a strike. Sheffield hitless in his first game back off the DL last night, and he's 0 for 2 today. He struck out and bounced to third. The first four hitters in the Dodger lineup today have combined to go 0 for 9 and make it perhaps 0 for 10. Ortiz picks it up, and that's that. 1, 2, 3, go the Dodgers. We move to the sixth, tied at 1. Joyner has drawn a walk and fouled out to Beltre at third base. And a little flare down the left field line, and that ball is fouled. Another example there of how Joyner trying to serve the ball in the left field a little bit more often. His first at bat, they pitched him away. The second at bat, they jammed him inside and he got himself out. That pitch back out over the plate, and I really think that's where Joyner wants the ball these days. Can still cheat and turn on a ball and hit it out of the park with the best of them. He's come such a become such a smart hitter. Just takes what you give him now. Well, he tried the fastball in that time and missed. Three and one to Wally joining. Park has walked four batters in the game. He's hit a batter. He's allowed one run on five base hits. Only started his career with then the California Angels, and he takes ball four. Boy, it's so strange to see Jack Clark wearing a Dodger uniform. I mean, he came up Jack hating the Dodgers with San Francisco. And they hated him. <laughs> Moved on to St. Louis. They hated him worse in the playoffs in 1985. But kind of leading up to that, this with Mike Sosha. Uh, one of the most vicious home plate collisions you'll ever see. Sosha was actually knocked out on the plate. These are two big, big men running into each other. Clark first tried to play it off like it didn't hurt, and then he did. The pain set in. Sosha knocked unconscious, hung on to the ball. And there's a base hit in the center field. Advancing on to second base is Joyner Fabregas with two base hits in the game. Second base. Sosha said they woke him up one in about two innings later after being unconscious. I'll tell you that and hung on to the ball. And Jack Clark is huge. Hit through that shoulder right into his face. And there they both are. And in fact, they're both even a little bigger now. Mm -hmm. And we asked Mike Sosha any hard feelings. He said no. He said it's a clean play. He said I understand that's part of the game, part of being a catcher. Sosha was is the best in the business at blocking home plate. He took the abuse that you had to take in order to make that play, and he developed a reputation. And now, when you talk about great catchers who block the plate, Sosha's name comes up every time. One and oh on Adam Kennedy who is single also been hit by a pitch scored a run the Angels threatening with two on and nobody out. Hard delivered outside. Park has been in so many jams already in the game today. Anaheim left two on in the first again in the second one in the third one in the fourth. That inning would have continued if Ortiz would have just touched home plate. Trying to score all the way from first base. Or stayed at third. <laughs> or stayed at third, which Ron Renicky wanted him to do. And then in the last inning, Anaheim had two on with nobody out. Park fans Salmon and induce a ground ball double play off the bat of Anderson. He hasn't thrown that many pitches, 87. Would you like to see him throw less pitches at that point in the game, but fatigue should not be an issue. He has been at his best when guys have been on base, as you mentioned last inning. 
getting Gloss with the strikeout and then Sam with the double play ball. Popped up. Infield fly rule in effect here as Cora will make the catch, and that'll be the first out of the inning. Well, we talked about the home run by Jack Clark in that 85 NLCS. Jack Buck with the call. And Dodger fans, don't bum again. great too and you remember when he hit that ball he walked he started running he ran about 15 feet off the foul line into his own dugout pointing at him saying I told you I was going to do it. Now Ortiz who will bat with two on and one out Ortiz is struck out he's also tried to put down a sacrifice and failed to do that and fails his first attempt here. Jack Clark made the point he said when I was named a hitting coach he said I knew I was going to get it. there was so much frustration built up against him with these Dodger fans. They announced John Shelby and he thought they're trying to help me out because they're going to announce Manny Mota behind. Me. So he says they got to carry the cheers right from one to the next and just blow by me. He said no no no. <laughs> he said when they announced me to come trotting out there on opening day they just let it all hang out and now said let's move on and forget about it. That's exactly right, too, because when the Dodgers score a lot of runs and his hitters are productive, there is Manny Mota. But they'll forget all about that eventually. It will take some time. Oh, and one Ortiz squares around a bunt and then pulls it out away. One ball and one strike. He's going to do the old butcher boy right there. And now Renick is going to come down and say, look, you already ran through my stop sign. I gave you the bunt sign, and now you're not wanting to do that. Just do what I tell you to do. Get the ball down. And this is another situation where what he has to try to do is bunt the ball to the left side. Now Adrian Beltre wants to come in and talk to Chan Hill Park about how they're going to handle it. You Steve, say, Look. you would imagine, uh, not to interrupt, but you'd imagine, I mean, Joyner is not a heck of a lot faster than Fabregas. Right. So maybe the same thing they had happen earlier. He's telling Park, you've got to get to the line. Here's the uh, the blimp angle as Jan Hill Parks right here as he pitches the ball he's going to want to move to this area so that Beltre doesn't have to come in and field the ball. They want to do the same thing let Beltre hang in here and if it's a, if, if the butt isn't hit that hard he can just go back and field his position. He wants Park to get to the third baseline to field the bunt if he bunts it. Fast ball on the inside corner and a count of two and two on Ortiz. Now the same situation with Leduc at first. Now he doesn't have to hold the runner on, so he can get a much better jump and crash in and get an errant punt if it comes his way and still go to third base to get an out. That should be strike three, and a throw down a second is not going to be in time, and Ortiz is out of there. He did offer it the pit. Classic example, I think, at this point, Shortstop. when you have interleague play and you have the American Dang. League team coming up here, and these guys don't work on their bunting or their hitting or anything, they're not expected to do it for the rest of the season, is where it can really hurt you and really lose a game for you because you can't get the job done. Well, Ortiz has failed now in three chances <laughs> to move a runner along with a butt. Three times he has come up with two men on in the game and not been able to advance a runner with a sacrifice. It has absolutely saved Chan Ho Park. Now Eckstein, first pitch swinging, ground ball to Corey. He'll go the short way, and again, Chan Ho Park puts the first two on and gets out of the inning. He still remains tied in one of these. Leisurely stroll through the air in downtown L.A., just having a fun and checking it out. Beautiful day here today. Sellout crowd for the freeway series. The Angels and the Dodgers are tied in one as we open the bottom half of the sixth inning. Sean Green will number off the end of the bat. Foul. One ball and one strike. We mentioned nary a hit from the first four hitters in the Dodger order today. They only have five in the game, but none by the combination of Loduka, Resolonic, Sheffield, and Green. 
This is the point in time where Green feels like this might be the most important at bat of his game. Liner into left center field, a base hit. Over to cut it off Darren Erskan, and Green hustling all the way. A big turn, and he'll stop right there. Green can run. He has seven stolen bases on the season. This is a great piece of hitting by Green, too, and I mentioned that it might be his most important at bat because his next one might be against Kirk Percival. Watch him go down and drive this ball the other way, just taking what Ortiz has given him here. Great balance through the hitting zone, head down, and that's the kind of swing that they paid 85 million bucks for. Ortiz, a guy who's starting to tire, knows that at this point in the game they've had so many opportunities, the Angels have, in order to blow this game out, and they haven't. So the Dodgers need to now take advantage of that opportunity, the fact that it's still a 1-1 game. And now perhaps the hottest hitter in the Dodger batting order, Marquise Grissom. One for two is double. Scored and bounced out to short in the fourth. See Grissom with the 13 home runs. You know, Gary Sheffield, while he was sitting there watching everyone else play while he was on the DL, joked with Grissom. He says, you're just like Barry Bonds. Tapper, they're not going to get green. They will get Grissom. He said, you're just like Barry Bonds. He said, every time you hit a home run for us, we lose the game. So stop hitting them. <laughs> well, don't forget our NASCAR coverage continues Here's tomorrow live from Michigan. Starting with NASCAR this morning, Here's followed by NASCAR Winston Cup Here's Racing on FX. Tony Stewart looks to defend his title. And then don't miss NASCAR Victory Lane. We go behind the scenes with Kevin Harvick. The Fox Network's your home for NASCAR. Yep, you know my boy Jeff Gordon sneaking up on Dale Jarrett for the points leadership. Watch out. Well, you're dialed in on the Fox Networks for That's all right. the NASCAR coverage. I'm a gearhead. That's the nicest thing someone's ever called you. Yeah. And that's because you were the one that said it. Oh, and won the count <laughs> on Adrian Beltre, who's one of two. You saw the pitch count. Still not too bad for Ramon Ortiz. He has not completed a game in his prior 11 starts this year and doesn't figure to finish this one here today. Well, Trey pops it up, and that one will drift over the screen and out of play. at Beltre and what he's gone through with the appendix and then the infection after that. And this is a guy who's still pretty much going through spring training at bats almost. I mean, he hasn't had a chance to really settle in and hit the way he's capable of. So he's still not the hitter that they want him to be and that they know he will be later on in the season. Popped up. Into short right field, and out there to get it is Adam Kennedy, and remaining at second base now with two away is Sean Green. And for Beltre, he's only appeared in 25 games. That's not even a full spring training in and of itself. Not enough. Catch Catch Looks like a NASCAR race right down there on the freeways here in LA. Okay. It's what it is, isn't it? It is when I get into my car, I'll tell you that. And you'll be going which way? I will be headed uh, this way, headed home, taking it down, going around, finding my spot, end up down by the beach somewhere. Of course, that beach not pictured in this scene. Well, you've come a long way from Eugene, Oregon. Come on, there was a beach in Eugene, 60 miles away. It was just so cold, no one ever wanted to get in it. There's the beach falls. Oh, if you'd like to stop by the Lions House <laughs> later on this afternoon, somewhere out there. Yeah. There's the haze. You know, a lot of the hitters for the Angels were talking about how tough it was for them to pick up the ball last night early in the game. And talked to Mickey Hatcher about that. And he says, you know, sometimes the haze gets in here. It's generally a pretty good ballpark to hit in and see in. But sometimes when it gets a little hazier around here, the ball gets a little distorted and it gets tougher. Well, the two teams have only combined for a total of 12 hits in the game here today. We're in the bottom of the sixth inning. We're tied at one. Green in scoring position and crew to the bat. Only one run scored all of last night. That was a home run by Garrett Anderson in the second inning. 
The Dodgers have had to go to their bullpen to get starting assignments this week. Kerry Adams, he'll get another shot at it tomorrow. And Carrara, very good last night. It's been a problem for Jim Tracy, and there's Chan Ho Park. Just the problems, the fact that your Dreifert didn't give you too many innings the other night. Browns out of the lineup on the disabled list. Well, Dreifert's game was a huge disappointment for the Dodgers. They had won two of the first three in Arizona. And Dreifert could not get out of the third inning. In fact, he never got an out in the third inning. After his team had scored six times. 3 0. And Pruder given the green light. Fouls it out of play. And to his credit, no one knows it any better than he did. He said, I was embarrassed out there. I'm pitching terribly. This is not what they expected out of me. It's not what I expect out of myself. As a starting pitcher, if someone throws a six spot up there for you, you think you can go out there and get a few outs before they jump all over you the way the This is a special Fox 31. Bottom half of the sixth inning. Green, the runner at second base. Cruder over at first. Two down. And Ortiz delivers to Cora. High and away ball one. And now George Fabregas wants timeout. This is where Fabregas will come out and remind Ortiz about his arm angle as we peek in. Hi, Ramon. You got to keep that arm up. Don't forget to keep your arm up. Let that thing drop down. That fastball isn't as good. Your slider doesn't break as well. It's nice to feel like you're right out there on the mound with those guys. Mm -hmm. Fabregas had said earlier that that's the thing, the one thing that you have to remind him more than any other pitcher on our staff is his mechanics. Well, that's where he's been missing to the last two left-handed batters with that fastball high and away. Well, when a pitcher starts to get tired, he's not able to get his arm up in the in the release point as well. It starts to drop down, which means the ball usually comes up. You can't drive and drive the, your pitch to where you want it. You leave it out there a little bit. It starts to tail on you. It goes up and away from the left-handed hitters, up and into the right-handed hitters. Big pitch right here, 2-0 to Cora with two on and two out. And Ortiz turns it loose, and it's swung on and fouled out of play. That was pretty good. You, you Fabregas go out and talk to the pitcher. You get pretty much what you want out of him. A fastball that he drove down into the strike zone. Now the 2-1. And again, popped up. This one may be playable in foul ground for Gloss, and it is, and that'll end the inning. The Dodgers strand two more. They've left seven men on base. We go to the seventh, even at one. Back down. Yeah, you wonder why in 98, 99 were not such great years for them. It directly relates to their pitching staff, and now they're starting to come back down starting to get a little bit better clearly better starting pitching and a good bullpen from this Dodger staff which is the greatest worry for them right now as far as their bullpen being overused who's available out there for them talked to Jim Tracy earlier today who said I just soon not have to go to Mike Fetters maybe Jesse Orozco could get an, a hitter maybe two but it would be great to see him get two outs on four pitches. All right, here we go in the Anaheim seventh inning. It'll be two, three, and four in the batting order, and Darren Erstad looks at a ball. You gotta wonder how many innings Chan Ho Park can continue to get into trouble and then wiggle his way out of it. Two and oh. You saw the home ERA for Chan Ho Park there a moment ago. At the end of the day, what you're most interested in, of course, win. There's a breaking ball strike. And since the beginning of last year, only seven pitchers in the major leagues have won more games than Chan Ho Park. He's actually won as many games, believe it or not, as Pedro Martinez. And while some may not put Park quite on that level, at 27 years old, he's going to win a lot of games if he stays healthy. The question becomes, will it be for the Dodgers? Or with somebody else. He's a free agent at the end of this year. They're going to have to back a truck up to his house. 
he has any kind of year like he had last year. Did Erskine get hit with that pitch? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And that's the kind that hurts a lot more. We saw Eckstein get hit by a ball earlier in the day, or Adam Kennedy, and didn't try to get out of the way of it. And once again in trouble, Shan Ho Park. This is the ball that breaks a little bit more than Erskine thought it would. It's down off his back wow. leg. No, it, it is his front knee that hurts, but that one goes right off the top of his shoe. And you see Erstad's ice light up as the pitch comes in, and then, oops, right off his toe. You know, players don't have steel toe cleats. That hurts when it hits you. And Erstad can run nine stolen bases. He's only been thrown out once, but Kruder, one of the best in all the baseball, throwing out runners, and Park, one of the best using the slide step and getting the ball to the plate. It's one of the reasons why Park's so difficult to score runs on because even when he does get in trouble, he takes away the running game So because he's, he's so quick to home. First that can run, runs very well, but you don't run just for the sake of running when you know that there's a pitcher out there that's so quick to home that you cannot steal the base. You got a guy that throws pretty well behind the plate. Park will give you a couple different looks over there. One and one to Troy Gloss, who has been walked by Park three times today. One of the ways that Park gets in trouble is that he drops too low on that back leg. The drop and drive that you talk about, sometimes he gets so low that he ends up pitching uphill. You want him to be able to drop and then drive down towards home plate like that pitch right there. Jim Tracy says sometimes he drops so low on that that he ends up throwing uphill to the plate. High fly ball into left center field, playable for Sheffield. Channel Park. Perhaps fortunate there that Gloss got a little too far underneath one. And I'll tell you what, he just barely Line missed that 15. one. When you look at Troy Gloss Seven. and the way he swings the bat, Seven. sometimes you look at it as a long, loping, big swing through the zone. But he's very quick and he gets started quickly. It's all right if you have kind of a long swing as long as you're getting it going quick. He just misses this one and it's because the ball beats him. But boy, that is a good looking swing right there. And that's when you come back to the dugout and you say, hey, I just missed the ball right there. I had a good swing, good pass at the ball. Just missed it. That happens a lot in this game. Now Tim Salmon, one of three, singled his first at bat, and Park starts him with a breaking ball in the outside corner of strike. Park has now reached triple digits with his pitch count today. But knowing that they had a reliever start last night, a reliever in Adams going again to Mark. We mentioned Jim Tracy leaning on Chan Hall Park, and he's certainly doing that here today. He needs innings out of Park, and he's pitched into the seventh. That's a great move right there by Park to throw over. The first time he's thrown over since Erst has been over there, but he just wants to tell him, hey, in this situation, I know that you might run. I got to make sure that I, I pay attention to you. I know you're over there. Don't go anywhere wasn't trying to pick him off. It was just letting him know that I know you're there. With some nasty breaking balls, the first two pitches in this at-bat to Salmon. In all of his at-bats, I mean, you can talk until you're blue in the face that Salmon hasn't been playing very well. Last week, he really started to pick it up. He's ran into a couple pretty good pitchers lately, and Chan Ho Park has been doing an excellent job of pitching him. The first, first pitch of almost every at-bat has been a nasty breaking ball in the outside corner. Salmon hasn't even offered at it because he can't hit it, but it's a strike, and you're down 0-1. Try to get him to chase it, and Salmon did not. One ball and two strikes. Stand the runner over at first base was hit by a pitch from Clark on a 2 2 count leading off the unit. And now Salmon in and out, in and out of the box. Now he'll finally get back in there. Channel Park loves pitching here at Dodger Stadium. There's no debate about that. Check out the number six and one here at home this year, an ERA under two. And opponents hitting 170 against Park. I mean, on the road they're only hitting 231. But look at that at home. 
We talk about the innings when pitchers start to tire. This is certainly it. Seven, eight, and nine. After Park gets over 105 pitches, which he has right now, 106, opponents' batting averages jump up to 250, which isn't great. But when you look at the numbers, you know, as you just mentioned, it's a lot better. You start to lick your chops thinking, I can go one for four against this guy now. Three and two now on Salmon after Park was ahead of him and no balls and two strikes. Well, you got to believe Erstad may be off and running here. Anything to try and generate some offense. Anaheim has scored two runs in this series. The Dodgers have scored one. Not a bad time to get him running, Salmon, with tremendous power, but certainly gap power as well. The deterrent there would be that Salmon has not played up to his capabilities so far this season. He's also leads the team in strikeouts, so a strike him out, throw him out situation is not what you want in order to generate offense either. Mm -hmm. Three, two, one, go. And no call by the umpire. The throw down a second, he's out there, and now the home plate umpire, Bill Cousy, tells us it's ball four. Well, you'd like to see the umpire let everybody involved know Tim Salmon was standing there at home wondering the same thing as was Chad Pruder. The toughest part for that for the umpire there is the fact that everybody's moving. There's a there's a guy trying to steal a base. Pruder's coming out of his crouch to catch the ball and make the throw. And the umpire, if you if you think about it, watch Pruder coming up to make the throw. The umpire here basically doesn't make a move when he calls a ball, but he lets everybody know about it when he calls a strike. So he probably just said, ball four, and that was it. The play goes on. Kruder certainly has to act like the guy is going and he's throwing down there, whether it's a strikeout pitch or ball four. He doesn't have time to even think about what the, what the umpire is going to call. He's got to make his play. Well, you see the six walks today matching a season high for Channel Park. Six of them in the game. And again, Anaheim threatening. And here's Garrett Anderson 0 for 3 today. Low and 2 to count. Anderson came up with two on and one out in the fifth inning and bounced into an inning ending double play. He left two on in the opening inning when he popped up to second base. It has been the heart of the order when Chan Ho Park has been in trouble and then pitching his best, either pitching his best or the heart of the order here for the Anaheim Angels having a tough, bad day, not getting it done. You get in the middle of the order, hoping you have chances to drive people in. They've had those opportunities, and they have not gotten it done. Oh, and two on Garrett Anderson. Swing and a miss. The bottom fell out of that pitch from Clark. And that is his fifth strike out of the game, two away in the inning. We talked about the two different breaking balls that Chan Ho Park has. This is the one he drops down a little bit, throws it more like a slider. That's just a filthy pitch in the dirt, but certainly not a strike. But when you have two strikes on you, you're a little more protective. And that's not a pitch you want to be swinging at, no matter what the count is. Tough day for Garrett Anderson. He's 0 for 4. He's left seven men on base. And now Wally Joyner, who has walked twice and fouled out to the third baseman, Beltre. Two on, two out, 1-1 one, one game in a seven. Swing and a miss, and he came in on him again. Unless Wally Joyner cheats and has in his mind that he's going to try to pull the ball to right field, I think that's the best pace to pitch him. That's a tough pitch to swing at. It looks like a good pitch when you when you swing at it, and then it ends up down in the dirt. Fast ball in, one and one. The Angels, one of 11, with runners in scoring position in the game today. On that last pitch, here's where Joyner thinks he's going to hit it. Here's where the ball ends up on that slider down and in where he cannot reach it. it ends up breaking off of your back leg there. Well, I had a lot of that when Dave Steve used to pitch. Nasty, heartbreaking slider. Looks like a good fastball to hit because it's so tough to put up the pick up the rotation. And when you go to swing at it, 
brake so hard down and in off your back leg that you literally can't reach it because of your bat angle can't get there. Two and one to Wally Joyner, Darren Erstand, the runner at second, Tim Salmon over at first. And Park turns it loose. Hit a mile but foul. That pitch right there is the same pitch, but it's a little bit higher in the zone. But really the only thing you can do with it as that pitch once again is going to end up right in here. But the only thing you can do with it is hit that ball into the seats foul. You can't keep it fair. It's, it's, you look at how he's struggling to try to keep his hands inside the baseball. It's so hard to do. That's a great place to live in there. But Wally Joyner will tell you, if you miss out over, if you miss with that pitch four inches more out over the plate, I'll hit that ball just as hard. I'll keep it fair, and we'll hit it into the seats. Fastball, and he got it. So Park again. Pitching out of trouble. The Angels have stranded the 11. Well, this is where the old high strike comes in, and you see that that's exactly where they wanted it. When I saw this in the first, before the replay, I thought, oh, well, that might have been out of the strike zone. And then you see the home plate umpire throwing Wally Joyner out. I would have said that this might have been too close to take. The mistake that Wally makes is that he's a veteran player. He knows that he thinks that ball was too high. He says it's terrible, but you got to say that's terrible. Say your piece and then get down to your position. I think Wally maybe stayed there a little bit too long arguing, and you know you can't argue balls and strikes. Phil Cuzzy, the home plate umpire, finally had heard enough and said, hey, that's it. I can't, I can't have you standing here at home plate arguing after the third out that long. When I first saw it, I, I thought that Wally might have had a point that that ball was out of the strike zone, but that pitch right there may have been the definition of the top end of that new high strike zone that they're talking about. Scott Spezio will take over at first base, replacing Wally Jordan. And the day is over for Channel Park, as Chris Donalds will bat for the Dodger right-hander, leading off the bottom half of the seventh inning in a 1-1 game. Sometimes, Tom, you just get so frustrated as a hitter. We talked about all the at-bats. How about that pickup? Look what I found down there by Gloss. And Donald's a hard hit bull, but he's retired. That is picking and grinning by Troy Gloss. Look, you can see him in the picture. He's well, very much ready to make the play. And then that's an ole ball. If it gets in your glove, it's a great play. If you miss it, it makes you look really bad. But there is no other way to make that play. Getting back to the joiner situation, I mean, we, we talked about how tough he had been pitched at his first at bat when he walked. I really thought they were pitching him in an area where he wanted to be pitched, where he thought he might have a successful day. Then his next three at bats, they were pounding him inside with the nasty breaking balls down and in. Real tough for him to keep the ball in fair territory with the way they were pitching him. Very tough to hit. Frustration builds up. Then you see a pitch that you don't think is a strike, and all of a sudden, it, you let it all out, and you end up taking a shower a little bit early. Mike Sosha came out to try and defend his player and nearly got tossed himself. 0 and 2 on Loduka. And it's outside. One ball and two strikes. Well, you got to give both pitchers a lot of credit here today. They have been in jams, it seems like, every inning. The Angels have left 11 men on base. The Dodgers have stranded seven. So Ramon Ortiz pitching the way that the Angels think will become pretty much commonplace for him in years to come. Park, they've seen it really for the better part of four years outside of a very bad 99, but he was terrific last year. Two and two on Loduka from catcher cam, and the breaking ball down low, three balls, two strikes. And again, we'd like to once again thank George Fabregas for wearing our catcher cam here on Fox. Three and two on Loduka. And a little floater that's going to fall in a base hit. Will he try to make it two? No, Loduka will stay right there as Salmon gets to the ball quickly. Take a look at our John Deere game summary. Bottom half of the seventh inning. 
And we are tied at one. Ortiz, solid for Anaheim, like Park for the Dodgers. Anaheim has had so many opportunities to score, leaving 11 men on base. And not much offense from the first four hitters in the Dodger lineup. That's the first base hit, or pardon me, the second. And not a lot of very hard hit balls, even that ball right there by LaDuca, just a just kind of a lob shot out in the right field. Rezalonic first pitch swinging, pops it up in the short right. Salmon's got it for the second half. Well, you know, Tom, I'll tell you why I like that ball by LaDuca, the way he served it out there, because in his first at bat, he went 3 2. They walked him on a slider. And when you're a hitter, 3 2 count, there's very few guys up there that are going to be looking for a breaking ball. You're looking for a fastball, especially when you lead off the game. He gets a slider. So in this at bat, he can't be sitting dead red because he's already seen a slider in the past. He gets the fastball, fights it off for a base hit, maybe thinking I might see a breaking ball 3 2 here. So he covered all his bases there and ended up with a hit. Now, Gary Shippey. 0 oh for 3. And he digs in. Fabregas looks out to Ortiz, and there's strike one. Now this is the time in the game where Gary Sheffield can change the game for you. One swing of the bat, he puts the ball in the seats. On a tiring Ortiz. You look at the bullpen getting working out there. You better be working when Sheffield comes up. Mike Colts, the left hander. Ben Weber, the right hander, getting ready. Low and away. One ball and one strike. And now. Another beach ball has come out onto the field. Gotta love it. They have worked Sheffield very well today. Fastballs away, sliders out of the strike zone away. But I can tell you, don't hang one. Because Chef doesn't miss hanging sliders. They come spinning in there and they say, he hit me. Good location that pitch down and away from Sheffield again. Try to pull it. And he's behind one and two. I think Sheffield's one of the really one of the rare power hitters that doesn't really trust his power the other way. He is a dead red hole hitter. He wants to pull everything. Gets up on the plate with that back foot, kind of bails and wails. Runner goes and a number off the end of the bat. Yeah. At Spezio, and that will retire the side. One hit, one left. We go to the eighth. Angels and the Dodgers tied in one. Uh, he has some electric movement on this fastball with the four seamer that he will run up in the strike zone and the two seamer that runs hard and away from the left handed hitters. 1 1 game as we open the eighth inning, and Fabregas, who has two hits and three at bats, looks at a strike. Decision time for Mike Sosha here in the top half of the eighth inning. Does he bat for Ortiz, who is well over 100 pitches? One hopper down to third. Beltre nearly fell over. But he throws out Fabregas, one away. Don't forget tonight on FX Saturday Baseball, it'll be Barry Bonds looking to continue his tour at home run pace. He'll lead the Giants against Jason Giambi in the E. The interleague battle by the Bay. And then Thursday, Sean Casey and the Reds will take on the White Sox in Thursday night baseball on Fox Family. Watch the entire baseball season unfold across the Fox Network. The Dodgers are only four games back. I mean, they're not in the same position, obviously, no way, shape, or form as Anaheim being a second place club 17 games out. But this is a very delicate time right now for the Dodgers with what the relievers being in the starting rotation, all of the pressure and the taxing that's been put on that bullpen. They cannot afford to start dropping three, four, five in a row, or seven out of nine, eight out of ten. That Arizona team has been on a roll under our old buddy Bob Brimley. I mean, they just finished a stretch of 17 games against Western Division teams, winning 13 of the 17 games. You're going to see the same situation come 
the end of the year when they start playing all their games within Division II the way it should be. Hey, this, is, this division's going to be a struggle all the way down to the end. I think the class of the division is the Arizona Diamondbacks. I think they have the strongest team top to bottom. Age is a factor. A lot of people talk about that. They're about average age in their infield of about 90. So if they stay healthy, they will get it done. Fastball up, three and two. Hey, look at the numbers on Adam Kennedy, home and away. That's a very hard thing to describe or try to decipher when you're talking about players, why they play better at home than they do on the road, or some guys play better on the road than they do at home. Who knows why? But there's some, you know, very big differences with Kennedy. No home runs on the road. You talk to the guys on that team, it seems like you don't notice an Adam Kennedy for a lot of the time until you need a big hit, and that's when you get it from him. Well, these two teams are mirror images of one another as far as that is concerned. They have not been good road clubs. Anaheim seven games under 500 five games under pardon me the Dodgers seven under. and a ground ball down to first gobbled up by Logan Burgess has retired the first two back but both have been very good home teams. in fact the Dodgers have the best home record in the league at 21 and 9 and Anaheim at 18 and 12 good solid days work by Ramon Ortiz his day is over Orlando Palmero was in the on deck circle and now they're going to bring up Jeff DeBannon to bat for Ramon Ortiz. Here you have please to Angels. And for Ortiz. Number 55, Jeff DeBannon. DeBannon with only seven at bats on the year. One hit. Yes. Never fun to be a guy who's a pinch hitter. I mean, guys made a career out of it. We talked about M Manny Moto with the Dodgers, but you, know, you sit there as you see Ramon Ortiz and his day being over with. Usually you come in there, the philosophy of a pinch hitter is usually don't be waiting around for your pitch because most of the time you won't get it. You better go up hacking. First fastball you see, you better let it fly. Been sitting there for seven or eight innings usually a lot of times facing the other team's closer or one of their best relief pitchers. Of course, Dave, and you Hansen. get up there and you're 2 right off the get-go and you're saying, I, oh, I just got here. Give me a give me a chance at this. Well, we saw Dave Hansen there momentarily. Hansen set the major league record for pinch hit home runs in a season last year with seven. And a ground ball to the right side. Rezalonik's got it. And the inning is over. Dodgers bat in the bottom of the eighth. Tied at one. On a great views you're seeing of the game are being brought to you us today by Monster.com's Blimp Skeeter. Monster.com operates two blimps in the U.S. Whether you're currently looking for a new job or want to get ahead in your current one, Monster.com can help. Monster.com, work life, possibilities. A 1-1 game, bottom of the eighth inning, and now on to pitch. He's been very good against not only left-handers, but especially good against a righty. Left-hander Mike Holtz. Yeah, figure that out. He holds the righties to about a 200 average. I'll tell you what, he can... <laughs> that was... A filthy slider right there for Todd Green. There's nothing worse for a left-handed batter when you square around to drop down a drag bunt and you're looking straight at the baseball. You're saying, I hope this thing breaks. Sean Green, Marquise Grissom, and Adrian Beltre. And that one off the outside corner. One ball and one strike to Green, who is one of three. He's single to left center in the sixth inning. One run, six hits, 11 men left on base for Anaheim. The Dodgers, one run, seven hits, and eight men left. We mentioned Green has been on fire in the absence of Sheffield and having a very good year. He had a great first half last year, Steve, and then really fell off the second half. This year, we talked about it earlier that he's really picked it up since... Someone said something about it. Jim Tracy said, I need production out of you. We have guys hurt in the lineup. Sheffield's out of there. I need it from you. Fooled by the breaking ball there, and a count even at two and two. 
He said for a while in his career, he was platooning only against right-handed pitching. He likes to face lefties. He thinks it keeps him in better as a hitter. That pitch right there, the big breaking ball, the right shoulder fell off of the ball. He'll be telling himself now, keep that front shoulder in and drive the ball back up the middle. That's usually when they bust you inside with a hard fastball. Swing and a miss on another breaking ball, and Green is gone. One away. Now this is just great pitching by Holtz. Look at the location where Fabregas wants it. That falls down in the zone. It would not be a called strike. Very tough to lay off of. Green puts a pretty good swing on this pitch, but you just can't hit it. You still see his head right down on it. Take another look at it from catcher cam because we got every angle known to man. And he didn't hit any one of those pitches. Banners, but only gave up one run in six hits. Ortiz walked three. Band six giving up one run in seven. So now the Dodgers, and this gives you an idea about how taxed the bullpen is. It's a 1-1 game, and they're bringing on their closer, Jeff Shaw, for the ninth inning. Oh, one down low to David Eckstein. Very few closers in today's game are ever in a game unless it's a save situation. This is either a, a win, loss, or a no decision opportunity for Shaw. They have so many bullpen problems down there that don't have guys that are available. Fetters has a little bit of a problem with his arm right now. The, Leading the National League in saves is Jeff Shaw with 18. A nice job since coming over. We were there that day. Jeff Shaw came over. Two and a half years ago now. And there's a base hit in the right field off the bat of X guy. His second hit. And three at bats. He's knocked in the only Anaheim run of the game. He's one of those guys you have to watch him play day in and day out to appreciate what he's bringing to this team. Absolutely, and there's a pitch that he gets up on top of. Another illustration of the high strike that we're seeing, and he's a little guy. It's funny because they said he's the kind of guy that grows on you, and a lot of guys do not get the opportunity to grow on you. They see you play a few at-bats in spring training. They say, yeah, can he play or can he not play? He's not a pretty player out there. Nothing he does looks really good or fluent. He just flat out gets the job done day in and day out. And they love him. Now Darren Erstad, and will he be asked to play small ball here in the top half of the ninth inning? The Dodgers believe so. They have Beltre pulled in on the grass at third. Of course, you can make an argument. You could always play Erstad in on the grass because he can run. The guy is going to be stealing. If you feel like you get a pitch to handle, go ahead and hack at it. Hit and run always was the guy will be stealing. You have to swing at any pitch thrown up there, which that's what that was. But you're technically correct. Yeah, the guy's always going to run before you have a chance to swing. Right. Oh, one runner not going this time, and it's hit down the left field line. Sheffield at the track, and he makes the grab. And tagging and going to second is Eckstein, and the throw there, and he's safe. Heads up, base running by Eckstein. He realized Sheffield in all of momentum was going towards foul ground. It's a gamble, but it looks great if you make it, and that he did. I love it because it's aggressive base running on a 1-1 game late in the game. Make something happen. Make a guy throw you out. Gary Sheffield doesn't have the greatest reputation as an outfielder. Look at Eckstein coming back. It's a over in that corner. It's a tough play to make. He, Eckstein's got good speed. Love this play. Slides away from the tag. That is a great, great play. Even if he gets thrown out right there, the way I look at it is Gloss is the kind of guy that if he pops one out, he still gets you the run that you need. Now you have an opportunity where all Gloss has to do is get a base hit in order to score a guy. I love this play. I love aggressive base running in smart situations. Make them make a play. And I'll tell you what, Sheffield made a pretty darn good throw into mm -hmm. second base, too. The Angels, one of 12, with runners in scoring position. And now it's Gloss, who's been walked three times. Just missed hitting one out of here back in the seventh inning. We talked about Eckstein growing on you. Just grew on me right mm -hmm. there. Love that play. Well, we mentioned they're one of 12 with runners in scoring position today. Guess who has the one? You guessed it, David Eckstein. And for the younger kids out there that wonder about a play like that, he knew when that ball went off the bat, 
that it was either going to be a foul ball, and so you have nothing better to do than tag up, even at first base, as now they're going to walk Gloss, or it's going to be a ball that's caught because he saw where Sheffield was playing Erstad and it was over there towards the line. So you're either going to catch it in fair territory where you have nothing better to do than tag as well, or it's a foul ball. So go back and tag. Take the opportunity. You can even take off like you're going to go to second and stop and come back if the play develops in a way where you think you can't make it. But there's no reason why you shouldn't go back and tag on that play just to have the opportunity to go to second if it arises. Loss walk for the fourth time in the game. That's a season high for any Anaheim Angel. And now it's Salmon who has struggled so badly with runners in scoring position this season. Three for 45 on the year. And with Timmy Salmon, that is just a shot. Strike one. And once again, first pitch as of every one of his at-bats today, a nasty pitch on the black at the corner of the zone to put him in the hole 0-1. It's amazing that Salmon hitting at 215 into this game still leads the team in on base percentage and that's because he's still getting his walks well he's been an outstanding player for the Angels since being named the rookie of the year out of Grand Canyon University in his native hometown of Phoenix Arizona and you see the all-time franchise leader in home runs and he's banging on the door for the rest of them. 0 one low and away a ball and a strike you know it's nice that your family can have a little chuckle at you even when you're not playing well about 10 days ago I ran into Salmon's brother in a restaurant and he looked at me and said don't talk about my brother right now he's terrible <laughs> that's a brother that played football at NC right that's Matt. right <laughs> big guy too I would think Salmon at this point would be getting tired of them pitching around Gloss in order to get to him. Down low, two balls and a strike to Salmon. You know, in this day of high-priced contracts, long-term contracts, the only thing that keeps you going as a player, really, is your personal pride. Salmon's got a lot of money. He's got years left on his deal. It's not that he's playing for another contract. It's his pride in his game at this point. You go to the plate after they intentionally walk Troy Gloss and you say, you're walking him to get to me? That's not sitting too well. And that's what makes you a better player. But until you start to deliver in this season, Salmon has had a tough time doing it. They're going to continue to do it. Gloss has been wearing it out. 2-1. And he pops it up. So the frustration continues for Salmon. Infield fly rule is the second out of the inning. One of the things that had been talked about with the Angels is the fact that Salmon was jamming himself, either standing a little bit too close to the plate or for some reason letting the ball get in on him too far. Watch this ball. Straight fastball, not tailing at all, pretty much out over the middle of the plate. Tim Salmon jamming himself right there. You see the ball getting in on him and popping it straight up. Just for some reason, not getting the hands extended quick enough and getting the hands through the hitting zone to let the bat head get to the point where he wants it to be. Very frustrating for a very consistent player over the years. So now it'll be Garrett Anderson. Been a tough day for Anderson as well. He has ended two innings in the game with two men on base. Two on, two out, and Anderson waits and Shaw delivers, and it's inside and low for ball one. Anderson popped up, ending the first inning with two aboard. Left a runner in the third when he flied out to center. He had two on and one out in the fifth when the inning ended with a double play. And then with two on and one out in the seventh, he struck out against Chano Park. it away one and one. You know, Tommy, there were some rumblings about Garrett Anderson and his start this year. We talked about the monster season that he had last year, and one of the reasons 
they thought maybe he was a little slower this year. He was moving over to left field. He was not happy about moving the left field. Not that he thought he was a better center fielder than Darren Erstad, but he said, I did play a good center field. Why am I moving? Bumped him over to left, put Erstad in center field. And sometimes that's frustrating for a player. It's like, why did I get moved? Did I do a poor job? And no one could say no. As you look at Erstad, his teammate there, the center fielder on the bench. Just a little unsettling for a guy sometimes when he thinks he should be playing one position and he gets moved to another. 2-1 on Anderson. And he pops it up. Foul ground. And that one will drift out of play. I do know that one of the things that Mike Socia loves about Garrett Anderson is the fact that he shows up to play every day over the last five seasons, averaging 155 games. When you, when you know that you have a horse in your lineup that you can pencil in every day, day in and day out, and he wants to play and he goes out there, well, that makes it a lot easier for a manager, especially when he's a productive player. Kind of has backfired at times with Erstad, who is a guy who's been hurt this year with the right knee problem and his back. Hasn't wanted to come out of the lineup. Makes it tougher for a guy to get healthy. Darren Erstad will not be healthy for the rest of this season because his knee is not going to get better while he plays on it every day. 2-2 two, two on the way. And Anderson lets the fly ball into right field. Room out there for Sean Green, and the inning is over. The Angels have left 13 men on base. Dodgers bat in the bottom of the ninth. We're tied at one. Great feet or bad feet, but you check out the feet of Chad Kruder messing up the feet of Ramon Ortiz there on the play where Ortiz had already run through the stop sign and then forgot to tag home. You got to love interleague baseball in the National League stadiums when the American League pitchers have to find themselves out on the base paths. Well, you would think somebody would tell Ramon Ortiz from when he started playing in the Dominican Republic that you need to tap home plate. Just a little tap is all it takes, too. Bottom of the ninth inning for the Dodgers. And it's 2-0 and on Chad Cooter against Ben Weber, who came on and retired Grissom and Beltrada and the L.A. eighth inning. Bruder will be followed by Cora, and you can pretty much bet on Dave Hansen. Of course, you got to give Cruder a lot of credit on that play. It's kind of like a tailback who will be going towards a hole, show you a leg, take it away, and go the other way. He kind of showed him home plate and then took it away from him by sliding that left foot back in his way. Ortiz had to jump over it, and he missed the play because of it. Ball four to Cruder, and you figure Tommy Goodwin perhaps would be brought on to pinch run for Cruder. They do have good one available to come off the bench and bat. Going to find himself a helmet. Legs are loose. Tommy Goodwin, you know that he's in a situation not being in the lineup as much as he'd like to, but over the last inning and a half, I'm sure he's been up in the clubhouse riding a stationary bike, running up and down the runway of the clubhouse maybe break a little bit of a sweat so that he's totally ready to run right now if he has to go first to third or if they ask him to steal a base this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority the commissioner of baseball it may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent so now bud black the anaheim pitching coach out to have a visit with weber Good one in four of his six full major league seasons has stolen 50 or more bases. I mean, he can really run. He's gotten a lot of playing time of late when Sheffield was out, but once Sheffield took back over in left field, there was no debate about who was going to be in center. The more productive player between the two, Marquise Grissom. Now Cora. He squares to button. It's ball one down low. Of course, we talked to Jim Tracy about that yesterday, and he said, hey, I'm not above experimenting with my lineup. I'd like to get Tommy Goodwin back in the lineup because of the speed that he has. Maybe the possibility of playing Sean Green at first base, and then you have an outfield of Sheffield, Grissom, and Goodwin. What do you do with Paul Aduka if he's not catching? Once again, and it's mostly for the kids that are watching, but some major leaguers make the mistake. He's got to bunt this ball to the right side of the infield. 
And he tries to bunt it that way, and it's foul. Well, Goodwin has 15 stolen bases. He's been thrown out six times. A lot of managers like to have a guy who runs like Goodwin, and you're talking about not just a middle-of-the-road base stealer. I mean, he's one of the best there is, one he of the does. fastest men in the game. He does some low flying. You'd like to see him steal second and then bunt him to third. Absolutely. There he goes. And the pitch is taken. Throw down a second, and he easily steals second base. Good win, 16th of the year. The Dodgers have the winning run in scoring position with nobody out. Well, now that the whole situation changes, before you needed to punt the ball to the right side, now you see Troy Gloss going in to talk to Weber saying, how are you going to do this? Where are you going after you release the pitch? Are you coming straight to the third base side, or are you going straight in where I have to worry about possibly fielding this bunt? Because now Cora if in fact he's still bunting the ball and he should be if that's the strategy you had set up when Goodwin was on first Troy Gloss wants to know whether or not he's going to have to come in and field this bunt and Cora actually wants to bunt the ball hard enough so that Gloss does have to field the bunt that way Tommy Goodman Goodwin just waltzes into third base untouched well you saw Cora turn around and ask the umpire what is the count and apparently they believe he offered it that last pitch so he's behind now one and two well there's the steal he didn't offer at it. it was a called strike and you see the jump that Goodwin had coupled with the throw that was up and away from the plays you see the quick feet not the Lotriman feet but the quick feet of Tommy Goodwin well let's see if Cora you don't figure him bunting with two strikes just like to hook that ball to the right side and he tried to do so and fouls it off. Steve is a batter. You always hear, well, if a guy wants to pull it, be good to run something in on his hands if you're the batter. And the pitcher, you go away with him. Do you believe that to be true? Yeah, I think no question at this point where you're looking at it, you have a two strikes on the hitter, you're, you're way ahead. But if you're going to try to strike him out with a breaking ball, you got to go back door with it. You want him to try to have to work to hit the ball to the right side. You're doing him a favor if you throw him anything in because he's trying to hook everything. He's leaning out over the plate. He's trying to get out on his front foot almost. Do anything he possibly can do to hit the ball to the right side of the field. Shutout crowd comes alive here at Dodger Stadium. The winning run at second, bottom of the ninth inning. And through the hole into left field. Goodman will be held at third base. So how about that? They want Cora to hit it to the right side. He finds a hole through the left side. And now the winning run at third, and the Angels will bring everybody in. Well, it's like your good buddy Bob Brenly would say, now managing. If it works out for you that way, that's fine. If you don't do the job, you're getting fined for it. That ball, he was standing all over the plate. It was a backdoor breaking ball, as we talked about. He just punched it through the six hole. He got the guy over, but I'll tell you what, if he didn't, They'd be talking to him on the bench right now saying, hey, you got to do everything you can to pull that ball. Well, now they're going to make a change somewhere, or are they? I believe they're going to play maybe a fifth infielder, fifth infielder and try to cut down every hole there is. Darren Erstad will be brought in from center. Erstad goes over to first base. You put Spezio, who's been a middle infielder and a third baseman in his life. He's playing second base and you got a couple second basemen now and you're going to end up walking Hanson anyway to load the bases. This is a good move here. It makes a, a force out at any base. You're going to have to come home anyway. But it gives you a better double play opportunity. You got LaDuca who's going to be coming up next. We talked about the way he handles the bat and how strange it might seem to some people that he's the leadoff hitter for the Dodgers. But when he comes up into this situation, all of a sudden it's not so strange that he's the man walking up there. Handles the bat pretty well, doesn't strike out very often. So the Dodgers with a chance to win it. 
obviously the thinking here with two outfielders anyway any fly ball unless it's a very short fly ball ends the game with a sacrifice fly and if you hit it to center field ball game over you're talking about one of the fastest guys in the game at third base and Tommy Goodwin put the ball in play on the ground the Angels still have a chance to get a double play and get out of the inning by the breaking ball and it misses to Loduca. Now the thing that I always see happening very often with Major League pitchers, once you intentionally walk a hitter, it's very tough to throw a strike to the next guy. LaDuca ought to be very patient in this at-bat. 1-0. And there's a strike. Borderline call there. The Dodgers with a chance to win it here in the bottom of the ninth inning. Now we just got done saying he throws four straight balls. He already threw a ball to LaDuca, and boy, he got a gift on that one. 1-1. One, one. Dribbled foul, so Weber has gotten ahead of LaDuca at one ball and two strikes. Oh, how one pitch can change the way you approach your at-bat. LaDuca's not swinging at that pitch either if it was a 2-0 count. Now he's in the hole 1-2. Now, if, excuse me, Tommy. Now, if you're the pitcher, you're going for a strikeout here. Slider away. And a ground ball. Spezio will come to the plate, and they cut down the winning run for the time being. So Loduca fails to win it. The Dodgers still have the winning run at third. There's still only one out. Tommy, this is so great because what Sosha's doing here, it's like a softball game. Spezio, who's not really, how do you mark that in your scoreboard? He's like the, he's like the roving right fielder in a softball game. He's not really the second baseman going over there making that play. Coming home works exactly the way they wanted it to. You get the out at home. Now you're still looking for, uh, ideally, a double play ball. Strikeout certainly helps you in this situation too, because if you get two outs, you go back to playing normal baseball. Infield in, outfield in for Grezolanik, and he looks at a strike. When was the last time you saw eight players between two teams in the infield, not counting the pitcher? Isn't that the truth? Look at all of them. They're littered everywhere. Five infielders for the Angels. And the 0-1 to Grezolanik. Get down the right field line. It is foul. Game of inches. Well, he had a walk-off grand slam last night in Chicago in the Windy City Series. They nearly had one here in the freeway series. But now Weber ahead of Grezolana. No balls and two strikes. If you're hitting in this situation, it's like a sacrifice fly situation. You're looking to try to lift the ball. You hit the ball in the air, you darn near win the game. There's only two outfielders out there. All you have to do is get it half deep enough. Ball game. Over. And the Dodgers score in the bottom of the ninth inning. Rezolanik extending his hitting streak to 11 in a row. And the Dodgers, who have played more one-run games than any team in baseball this season, they're 28, and they win for the 15th time in the 28 game. I look at the key to this victory in my mind, especially when you get to the ninth inning, it's Tommy Goodwin, a guy who wasn't even in the ball game. As you look at Gretzelonic, trying to lift that ball, gets it up in the air, nice little line drive, probably would have been a, a line drive to the right fielder in a normal situation, but in this situation, it's the ball game base winning hit. Tommy Goodwin with the speed, stealing second base, and forcing the Angels to do things defensively that they didn't want to do as Mr. Weber reacts to that ball hit into right field. Speed kills, I'll tell you. So the Dodgers 